Good morning. This oversight hearing conducted by the Committee on Economic Development, Agriculture, Maritime Transportation, Power and Energy Utilities and Emergency Response is now called to order at 9.07 a.m. Notice of the hearing was disseminated to all local media outlets via electronic mail on September 3rd of 2019. With a second notice provided on September 8th of 2019, notice of the hearing was also made known on the Guam Legislature's website. The agenda for today's oversight hearing is for the committee to address the management team of the Guam Power Authority and members of the Consolidated Commission on Utilities on the issue of the CCU's recently approved energy conversion agreement between the Guam Power Authority and Korea Electric Power Company, or KEPCO, for the new 198 megawatt dual fuel power plant, which will burn liquefied natural gas as well as ultra low sulfur diesel. Notices to appear at this hearing were sent to the management of the Guam Power Authority and to the members of the Consolidated Commission on Utilities. And uh, with, that, with that, I'd like to welcome the members of uh, the panel this morning and uh, please introduce yourselves, uh, beginning with uh, Chairman Duenas. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Joey Duenas. I'm the chairman for the Consolidated Commission on Utilities. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, Senators. My name is John Benevente, General Manager of Guam Power Authority. Good morning. My name is Jennifer Sablon. I'm the manager of the Strategic Planning and Operations Research Division of the Guam Power Authority. Thank you. And, and with that, uh, I'd also like to recognize uh, uh, my colleagues who have joined me today, beginning with uh, Senator Will Castro, uh, Senator Kelly Marsh Titano, Senator Regine Bisco Lee, and Senator Jim Whelan. Thank you for joining me this morning. All right, so I will begin first with some questions. Um, the first question I have is, uh, the CCU has approved GPA's request to contract with the lowest bidder to build a new power plant, correct? And uh, what is the name of the company? Uh, could I have the general manager answer sure. the name? Because he's the one who worked on the contract, sure. and he has the official name. Uh, the official name is uh, Ukudu uh, Power. Guam Power Ukudu LLC. I'm sorry. Could Guam, you? sorry. Guam Ukudu Power LLC. Guam Ukudu Power LLC. And is this company um, part of a consortium of companies? And if it's a consortium, can you please list the other parties to the consortium? The consortium includes Korea Electric Power Company and East West. Uh, Korea East West Power. Korea East West Power. Is it true that Korea East West Power was the company who was operating and maintaining the Cabris 4 power plant at the time that the power plant exploded? Uh, that's correct. Does the contract contain language establishing who's responsible, this current uh, contract, who's responsible for certain provisions, for example, liability for damages, management of the plant, providing fuel, etc.? The current contract has uh, KEPCO, which is the lead, and EWP responsible for the whole facility. And again, uh, the, they will build, own, operate uh, the facility for the next 25 years and then transfer it to Guam Power Authority thereafter. Under the provisions of the contract, will GPA be funding any portion of the new power plant? GPA will be contributing about 40 million into the pipeline project. Into the <coughs> pipeline project. Pipeline project. Uh, that's 40 million. That's correct. There is in the contract I read a section that refers to a lump sum payment of 40 million. Is that what it's for the pipeline, or is that for the power plant itself? That's for the. Uh, we're Korea East West. Is a Korea, a Korea Electric Power is constructing both the pipeline to the facility and the auxiliaries, the transmission line connecting to the substation. And we're providing $40 million at the, uh, at the end of uh, commissioning after the, the facility, the power plant is commissioned. So the total amount paid for by GPA for the power plant will be $40 million, including the power plant and the fuel lines? That's correct. We'll be putting out $40 million. GPA received $125 million as a payment for the damage caused by the explosion of Cabris 4. <clears throat> uh, 
Can you explain how that, uh, was that payment from the operator of the plant or from the insurance company? From the insurance company. Will that 125 million be uh, used for that 40 million that's going to go towards the new power plant? There's, there were various uses of, of the 125 million, including some were given back to the ratepayers in terms of the fuel adjustment clause. It also uh, we purchased the land for about 10 million dollars. There was also other uh, uh, intermediate uh, requirements in the in the process of getting an insurance settlement were were responsible to keep the power plan from deteriorating. So some of that money went into there. So again, there, after all of those other expenses, there was something about close to $70 million, of which we have utilized about uh, $10 million recently, one for the uh, building of another pipeline down on the uh, Cabras Power Plant area to tie in that uh, the, the the transportation, fuel oil transportation line from the uh, dock to the power plants. And in addition to that, there's going to be a, a complete cleaning of those tanks and, uh, and the uh, inspection to make sure of its integrity. So all of that uh, were recently approved by the CC and PUC coming from that funding. And there will still be around 10, 10 to 15 million balance. And again, that could be for anything that could occur in the construction period, or part of our plan is to take a look at that to fund the conversion of uh, MEC 8 and 9 uh, to ultra-low sulfur diesel, which is about a $17 million uh, uh, price tag. So again, that's, how, that's why we provided $40 million, but the balance of it, all of this money basically had to be uh, put in uh, to the, had to be put back into the uh, power plant infrastructure. Did GPA initially seek payment from the plant operator, KEWP, uh, for the explosion? Uh, no, we didn't seek any payment from the, so we, who we seek uh, payment from is from our insurance because they have the explosion. No? According, uh, the insurance company has filed a lawsuit against KEWP uh, alleging that they are responsible for the explosion. According to that lawsuit filed by Dongbo Insurance Company and Chubb Insurance Limited from Singapore on April 12th of 2018, they say that GPA formally requested a meeting to resolve outstanding claims between GPA and KEWP arising out of that incident. We didn't, Is that we didn't, false? Uh, we didn't uh, get together to outstanding claims. The claims was with the insurance company. I'm not aware of any of outstanding claims that we were working with the KEWP, unless it's, unless it's the, anything that had to do with the performance management contract payment itself, Senator, but I'm not aware of anything like that. According to the lawsuit, uh, GPA attempted to uh, initiate a meeting with KEWP, and uh, KEWP um, refused to meet with GPA. Is that correct? Senator, I'm not aware of that scenario. I'm not, I'm not sure what the meeting was for. Can you clarify? Is there? Uh, the lawsuit alleges that uh, GPA attempted to meet with KEWP uh, as a result of that incident, the Cabras explosion, in order to resolve outstanding claims between GPA and KWP, and that KWP refused to meet with uh, GPA, violating a clause of the contract that's between KWP and GPA that says that uh, should uh, any discussion about claims uh, or disagreement about claims be had between the two entities, that a uh, meeting is uh, required between the two entities. Uh, Senator, it's really between the insurance company and KWEP. GPA is not a party in the lawsuit. We are not involved with claims or anything. We, our settlement was for the $125 million with the insurance company, and we don't have any uh, other claims filed in court or otherwise to that respect, other than what was settled. 
Why did GPA decide to file an insurance claim rather than uh, claiming damages against KEWP? Well, uh, we are insured by uh, all our plan assets are insured, and that's the first step of anything. Now, to file a claim against uh, KWEP, of course, you have to have a, a, a reason, a cause. We didn't have any reason to do that, Senator. The lawsuit filed by Dongbo Insurance says that an investigation found that KEWP was at fault for the explosion. Do you agree? Uh, GPA, uh, uh, what do you call it, engaged an independent uh, consultant that is involved in the engineering and manufacturing of slow-speed diesels, and that was BWSC. We engaged that independent consultant to find the root cause of what you know, of the problem that occurred at Cabris Power Plant. They came back that they, because of the damage to the equipment and everything, their report is inconclusive. So we really didn't have any anything that we could say who was the responsible party, or you know, again, we have to take a look at the machine. It's 20 years old. So many manufacturers or others have worked in this machine. Who was culpable? Or so again, it, you know, just the uh, the allegations or the insurance are filing against KWP as part of their subrogation rights, but we're not involved in that the lawsuit. So, are you aware of the investigation that the insurance company is referring to? Uh, I'm not aware myself, but I, I can bring somebody up here and ask if that's the question. The one that's our manager of engineering, Mr. Zovina Costa, who was handling uh, most of those insurance issues at the time. So I would have to ask him if, you know, and get back to you, Senator. Is he present today? Yes, he is. Could he uh, answer to those questions? Good morning. Could you uh, introduce yourself for the record? Please turn on the microphone. Thank you. Good morning, Senator. I'm Joe Vinicasa. I'm the engineering manager for the Guam Power Authority. Thank you. Are you aware of the investigation uh, that Dungbo Insurance is referring to that uh, Dungbo Insurance says uh, found KEWP to be at fault for the explosion? Uh, Senator, the, the insurance company uh, has not given GPA any uh, products uh, from, their, uh, from their experts. Um, so um, I'm not aware of any, uh, any reports from them. Thank you. According to the lawsuit, KWP, Dongbo Insurance is alleging that KWP failed to warn GPA that the generator was damaged, ready to fail, and in need of immediate replacement. Uh, to any of your knowledge, is this true? Not aware of anything like that, sir. Also, according to the lawsuit, KEWP hired other companies to conduct a control system overhaul in 2012 and a mechanical overhaul in 2015, and those companies failed to properly automate a shutdown sequence, failed to include a sequential shutdown scheme, and improperly designed the fuel shutoff valve, allowing the system to remain in manual operation, which disabled a part of the control system. To your knowledge, is this true? Senator, those are all uh, assertions, allegations by one party to the other. And really, uh, Korea East West uh, Power Company uh, is authorized uh, after approval from GPA to have various work done on the machine. And so, but as far as what they're alleging that because of all of that, uh, that failed, uh, we, we have no knowledge of that. So, uh, in discussion with the employees who were operating the power plant, did they indicate any of this to GPA, to not management? A, not aware of that. Sense. So you're unaware of uh, any of the GPA employees who were working at the power plant saying that uh, KWP failed to warn them that the generator was damaged and ready to fail, or that there were any problems with the shutdown sequence and this, <clears throat> excuse me, the shutdown uh, sequence or the shutdown scheme? We're not, I'm not aware of that, Senator. Also, according to the lawsuit, 
Five GPA employees attempted to control Cabris 4's electrical output without success by attempting to reduce fuel input. And after determining that that wasn't working, they attempted to call the KEWP operations manager who could not be reached at the time, uh, despite the fact that the manager is supposed to be on call for 24-7. Do you know if that's true? Well, it's a, the, uh, the standard uh, procedure. They try to get a hold of uh, help if necessary. But again, uh, decisions could have been made uh, in other uh, different modes uh, at that point, so that's my, that's my understanding. But is it true that the KWP operations manager was not uh, available at the time? Uh, that's my understanding also. Is it true that the KWP operations manager, pursuant to the contract, is supposed to be on call 24-7? Well, certainly on call 24-7, but again, that doesn't, if I'm on call 24-7, but I do sleep at times, no? Or other things like that, center, so that, that's a very, uh, uh, that's a very wide-ranging uh, scenario, no? The machines are built to be able to shut themselves down if any particular issue occurs. You cannot depend on, 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 uh, human beings to be the ones that will protect that equipment for every reason of cost, no? So that unit has protections for over speed, for uh, fault lines, for anything like that. Now, did any one of the protections fail? We don't know, Senator. But, it, for, but to have, for example, myself, I'm, I'm called 24 seven, to say the power, I'm gonna keep the power from going now. No, it doesn't happen that way. We have pr protective system throughout the uh, all the equipment that are, are are again very valuable and has to be protected. Sure. According to the lawsuit, uh, after they could not get a hold of the KEWP operations manager, they implemented measures to stop the Cabris 4 generator as they had previously at KEWP's direction, but those measures failed, it became a runaway station, and it eventually exploded. Do you believe that GPA employees did what they could to stop the station from exploding? Well, I can only say what they believe, no? And if they tried everything in, that they believed they could, then that was probably the case. Now, did they try everything that could have been possible? Uh, Again, that's still a potential uh, issue there. Uh, the uh, the uh, what they call the emergency stop button uh, was there. Would it have worked? We don't know. But that's one of the issues that came out that uh, it wasn't pushed. That's one thing. So. All right. Thank you. Uh, at this moment, I'd like to open it up to my colleagues to ask some questions, uh, beginning with uh, Senator Regine Biscoli. Senator, uh, may I ask to read my testimony into the record? Sure, but uh, we can do that after uh, okay. questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, in preparation for this oversight hearing, you know, we've been taking in a lot of the articles that have been. Um, posted by local media and listening to you all on the radio, um, just kind of all this back and forth. In one of the articles that was published by the Guam Pacific Daily News, um, Chairman Duenas was quoted as saying, the new power plant will fully comply with local and federal environmental regulations. This certainly is a relief from the original alternative of complying with US EPA regulations by retrofitting existing power plants, which would have resulted in substantial rate increases without improvements to the system's reliability, efficiency, or ability to meet future demand. This plant gives ratepayers reliable, responsible power at the lowest cost possible. And so I guess, um, Mr. Benaventi, my question to you is you are mentioning MEC-8 and MEC-9, and if you are still planning to retrofit MEC-8 and 9 after this new power plant is operational, how would you reconcile or how would you maybe explain to the, the listening audience, to the public, and to the committee that how do you reconcile this claim that the substantial rate increases are expected with retrofitting 
plans with also the claim that substantial savings will be realized with the new power plant? The, uh, the system today, which is, includes MSC 8 and 9, Caribous 1 and 2, or your base load units, if we had to retrofit those units and burn ultra low sulfur fuel, which by the the ultra low sulfur fuel is about 40% more expensive than the RFO today. And by retrofitting them, you not only have higher operation and maintenance costs, you would also decrease the efficiency of the power plant. So when you have to put in close to a $400 million investment, you're decreasing the efficiency of the power plant, increasing its operation and maintenance costs, that means all of that additional cost would be on top of what we're paying today. The difference with the new power plant is that its efficiency is tremendously higher than even the most efficient machine we have today, MEC 8 and, 8 and 9. So therefore, the fuel savings from that, which is, I mentioned, in, uh, it's about the reduction of about 35 million gallons of fuel a year, translates to a lot of sa uh, cost savings from the fuel side to pay for the power plant. And at the same time, the power plant will be compliant with all those regulations, uh, not only today, but from what we can see into the near future, in the foreseeable future here. And uh, again, the, the cost savings is on ultra low sulfur diesel, which is quite more expensive than the heavy oil. By the way, which we have been burning since 19, uh, the mid-1950s, the heavy oil plant. So again, this is a major conversion. And again, it's not a decision that was just made by GP. It's a, deci uh, it's a decision that was brought upon us by the change in regulations uh, required by US EPA. So that's why these two solutions are uh, these two alternatives were considered, and of course, the construction of a new power plant was the least cost. And in fact, at, at the end of the procurement process, uh, provides savings. Not only is it paying for the power plant, but it also will provide savings to the ratepayers. Senator, may I add to that since you quoted me? Certainly. Um, first off, there's a difference between Cabris 1 and 2 and MEC 8 and 9, or what we now call Cabris 8 and 9. Cabris 1 and 2 are nearing the end of their useful life. They're close to 50 years old. Uh, MEC 8 and 9 are not. They're about 20 years old. In addition to that... Uh, I apologize, Mr. Chair. So what would be the useful life for MEC, for Mech 8, 8 and, and 9? 9, their useful life should be in the range of 40 to 50 years. That would be their useful life. But there's one other aspect, if I may, be, uh, if I may continue. And that is the fact that when Cabras 1 and 2 were built in the early 70s, uh, that technology was already about 30, 20 to 30 years old. So the technology is really old. The concept is you would not want to take uh, technology that's about 70, 80 years old and try and patch things onto it uh, and, and make it perform more. And you would have to put so much money in to extend the useful life and at the same time, as John has adequately said, you would not realize the efficiencies out of that unit, so the operating costs would go up. With MEC 8 and 9, or what we call now Cabris 8 and 9, the units are, are more modern, if you would. The technology is newer, and so therefore the investment would not be as great, and they would still be able to contribute to the grid. The other thing is, when we look at this, we're looking at the Re what we call repowering generation. So therefore, the new Ukudu power plant would be the main base load power plant. That's what you would run, you know, first, always. And then eight and nine would come in as needed. And um, with all the different moves that we're making into renewable energy, there are different uh, scenarios about running these different base load plants. We will end up again with the base load plant at Ukudu and eight and nine down at Cabras. And so that made the most sense in terms of investment into the units as well as operating costs and trying to bring back, trying to bring down the bill to the ratepayers. That's the, that's the scenario that brings down the bill to the ratepayers for all of those reasons. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, recognizing that we have long-term cost savings in dollars and also in environmental impacts, what would you say, maybe for you or Mr. Benevenzi, what would you say is the short-term cost um, in dollars of converting MEC 8 and 9? And when will GPA or GovGuam begin to pay that cost? Um, can I start for a minute? I, I, would, I would say from the policy perspective, uh, it makes sense to take 8 and 9 and convert them. And John, I think earlier said uh, the conversion would be in the neighborhood of 10 to $17 million. $17, so $17 million. So that's a small investment compared to 1 and 2, which is in the hundreds, multi-hundreds of millions of dollars. So it made sense to convert those, realizing that as you run them, you're not going to run them as much as you run your main new power plant, which is the Okadu power plant. And the price tag on that power plant um, has inflated. When we first were talking about it, we were talking about the range of $400 million. Is that correct? That's correct. And today's rate is, or today's number would be? The, their estimate numbers, Senator. And, uh, their and that would be? Their estimates are like $600 million, $700 million. But may I go back to one point? In evaluating all of these issues, the, the one point I would look at is what is the cost to the ratepayer? So you want to know what the per kilowatt cost is. So the per kilowatt cost of this plant is projected to be five cents a kilowatt hour. So it would cost us for this generation five cents a kilowatt hour. To put that into perspective, when the original contract was done for what is called MEC 8 and 9 and now called Cabras 8 and 9, the cost there was 5.5 cents a kilowatt hour. So therefore, they're very similar cost in terms of base load power. You want the lowest possible generation cost, and that's 5 cents. So you know, if, if it came in and, and this new power plant was at 10, 12, 15 cents, that would not make sense to me. So Mr. Chair, are you saying that because the price per kilowatt hour is so low that that $200 million is negligible? What, 200, no, what I'm the, saying- The increased yeah, cost. Yeah, what, what? what I'm saying is the amount that is actually spent by the pro partner to build the plant and to operate it for 25 years and at the end of 25 years transfer it to us, what we are paying for that plant is five cents a kilowatt hour for every kilowatt hour they deliver. That's what we're paying. And there are in the contract sufficient provisions to that uh, penalize them if they don't deliver. We have a contract. The contract says what they have to deliver, which is the power, reliable, stable power. And to meet certain availabilities, in other words, they have to be on 96, 98% of the time. To meet all of that, what you are paying is five cents a kilowatt hour. That's the number you have to focus in on. Whatever they pay, they invest, they have to recoup their cost. They can't come back to us and say, oh, by the way, we need some more money. That's it. It's five cents a kilowatt hour. That's what you have to do because that's what we did with MEC 8 and 9. That was a 20-year build, operate, transfer. What did we pay for MEC 8 and 9? 5.5 cents a kilowatt hour, roughly. And that's what you pay. That, so you have to compare it like that. That's what we look at. If memory serves, in a, in a public hearing in the last term when we were discussing um, Bill 233-34, which was the rezoning for this mm -hmm. power plant, mm -hmm. um, one of the main questions that was asked by myself and many other members of the legislature was, do you anticipate an increase in the base rate? And the answer at then was no. Is yeah. the answer still no today? Uh, I was the one who said that I didn't believe there would be a need for a base rate increase. And I actually stated that back in 2016, I believe, before the PUC. I still am of the opinion that there won't be a need for a base rate increase. Uh, some of the consultants that we hired have, have a different opinion. They're very conservative. But at the, at the end of the day, we all agree that the bill will be lower. That because of the fuel savings, because this plant will be run uh, more than the other power plants, this, this will save the community, our ratepayers, more money. 
So you're saying that the base rate would likely stay the same. How about all the other fuel surcharge, LIAC, all of those rates? What, so I'm, say so you, what, saying what I'm saying is... On the whole, our rates will decrease? On the whole, the bill will go down. The rates are not going to change. If, if you go with my scenario, which I, which I really believe, that there's no increase in base rates, then we will be burning less oil, and in burning less oil, we'll spend less on the bill. So when you get your bill, there's two components. There's the base rate component, and then there's the LIAC charge. So what I'm saying is the price for the oil, the barrel of oil could change, that goes up and down, but the volume that we burn, we hope, that's, the, that's, that's what this plant is designed to do, will be less. So if you burn less oil, then that's, that's a lower amount on that part of the bill that translates to the bottom line bill being lower. And that's how that will work. And, and I'm going to tell you that uh, I, I really believe this because the bid that was submitted is a really good bid. It provides the, the community with reliable, stable power, and it puts the onus on the company to produce all of this. Now, you have to realize that whenever you do something like this, what is it? You rely on a contract. You get into a contract. So you want to make sure that the contract clearly identifies what's to be delivered, and you want to make sure that there's sufficient provisions in that contract to make sure that the party that you're contracting with delivers what they say they're going to deliver. And we believe we have a very good contract. It's a long negotiations. This is not something that just happened this past year. We've been working on this for about a decade now. The concept, then narrowing it down, and finally getting to the point where we are today. So this new power plant would be um, run on ultra low sulfur diesel, is that correct? That's correct. The, and the, there have also been discussions, um, and I think many of you have been quoted saying that GPA plans to convert to LNG. Okay, let, let me go back here. The agreement will require the partner to build a power plant that can run on both ultra low sulfur diesel and liquefied natural gas. The commitment is to run it on ultra low sulfur diesel first. And as we run it on ultra low sulfur diesel, we will explore LNG and we'll explore, is it really beneficial? What will the cost be? And after all of that discussion and all of that exploration, that's when we'll start to gravitate towards LNG. But right now, the focus is to build the power plant because we need to replace Cabris 1 and 2 and to burn ultra low sulfur diesel. That meets all the EPA requirements that we have to meet that gives us the reliability that we need, that gives us the availability and the efficiency that is good for our community. So are you saying that GPA doesn't have a current plan in place to move to LNG? You're still kind of in the discussion and discovery phase? What I'm saying is, in order to go down that road for LNG, we would then come up with some thoughts, and we would have to again work with the PUC. So those discussions haven't occurred yet. But, but, that, but we are looking at that for the future. So what you're saying is this power plant that, the power plant that we're discussing leaves the door open for the potential of LNG, but we don't yes. have a plan yet in place. We haven't gotten to the discussion stage where we are, have some firm plans of going to LNG. I think John. Mr. Benaventi? Uh, German is correct. We're the, uh, the submittal for the plan is to burn both fields, and this has been looked at since, again, part of it is in my testimony uh, in the integrated resource plan, because again, LNG is the cheapest fuel and, and the cleanest of the fossil fuels. So since 2014, that's been, been looked at as the plan, and what was filed with the PUC and approved by the PUC is for ultra low sulfur diesel. And like the chairman mentioned, it's really for one power authority to continue to look at uh, natural gas as the, as the source. But the first thing to do is to build the power plant on ultra low sulfur diesel. We, do, we did have two previous studies that were looked at, one in 2011, but more relevant is the April 2014 study done by 
uh, R. R. W. Armstrong, which looked at natural gas and where will we site the uh, storage facilities and how how will we bring natural gas to the to the power plant. So we have done work on natural gas, but again this is 2014. So the next step really is to get the plan approved, move forward and the direction provided to us to continue to evaluate, reevaluate the, have an uh, update done on the study, continue to now pursue, look at the market, how do we get the best price for natural gas here, and, and look at all the different aspects of it, come back with a, with a recommendation to the CCU and the PUC. So that will come after we get the new power plant uh, built, or after, not necessarily built, but contracted and moving forward. So we've begun the process, but I cannot come before you today and recommend immediately until I have something that we could recommend that could be achieved in the, in the, in the period of time, like where would the location be? We have to work out some more of these de details. Uh, and how much, uh, we have an estimate which I think is still good as to how much the differential between ultra low sulfur diesel and natural gas are and and that's where we're talking about in our in in the presentation I provided as much as another fifty million dollars more a year savings by going to natural gas and so again that's the process we're going through and that's why we're not the decision before the CCU, uh, the PUC today is for them to decide on the new power plant, which evidently burns both fuel and evidently as approved by themselves. No? Thank you. Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll wrap it up with this. But Mr. Benaventi, you mentioned that this is the cleanest of the fossil fuels. Is that correct? Natural gas is. So this is next to it. But the it's still also, it's still pretty dirty when you compare it to renewable energy sources. Is that correct? Well, you can compare fossil fuel with renewables. Renewables, of course, uh, is uh, clean energy, but uh, but again, uh, that's a really a whole different discussion in terms of. You're when, absolutely right. When you have to compare capacity, we have to compare keeping the the lights on. You know, it's an evolution, and, and as much as renewables are still out there and it's moving ahead, moving fast, there's still a lot of unknowns that has to be settled in before you can get an island like Guam so isolated to get 24-7 power on a continuous basis, even when it rains, no? Even when you have the monsoons come up, no? So again, if, uh, you know, we're willing to go load shedding and go to that kind of scenario, then, of course, it can be done. But to really get to a renewable point, the new power plant is needed. We can go up to 25%, and we've contracted for most of it. The last part of that equation is com uh, coming up before the end of the year, which is 40 megawatts with full storage batteries at, on Navy lease and land lease from the Navy. That will tell us what the price of batteries will be. And that's the battery that will hold that energy in the daytime and we can use it at night. So that's the first model as to how we're going to move forward uh, beyond and what the cost will be and all of that. So again, so all of that will come in by 2022, 2023 at the latest. But to go now to 50%, you can't do it without this new power plant. Because the rest of the system are, I mean, age and they can work. They, they, they cannot move up and down uh, with renewables. So again, uh, we're certainly looking forward to moving more and more renewable center. We're just trying to make sure that the lights stay on while we do it, that's all. Mr. Ben Benaventi, I appreciate your response, but I, I respectfully disagree. I feel like that this new power plant just pushes the timeline out further for us to really be thinking about a renewable energy future for Guam. And I think we really need to be thinking of these things in terms of our children and the, the burden that we're placing on them and our grandchildren. And I think we just really need to 
take the time to invest in much more forward-thinking measures. Just even the last few years, there have been incredible increases in technology with regard to battery storage for solar and so many different other wave technology and, and things that we could be exploring. But I feel like we're all collectively investing so much in something in outdated technology that's not going to be truly sustainable for us. We're, we're, you know, with geopolitical issues going on, if for some reason uh, these ships don't stop coming to Guam for a week, two weeks, where will we be then? It's not even load shedding at that point. Our, our base load, I mean, we just can't continue to operate this way. And so I'm, yeah. I'm very concerned about that. And I have yeah. a number of other questions, Mr. Chair, but I'll just leave it at that for now and, and have my colleagues um, give, give them the opportunity to ask questions. Mr. Benaventi, I do have a question. Uh, you mentioned uh, battery storage. Is it true that the proposal for the new power plant includes a battery storage component? That's correct. That's for fre frequency control. But again, there's two types of battery storage. One is just for so many, uh, less than an hour, just to control frequency. Today, your, your power is going like this. That's just to stabilize that. The second part is the, the, uh, that will store energy, so much energy, for a period of time. So you can have 40 megawatts for six hours. So that's, uh, so that's 240 megawatt hours and that you can utilize in the rest of the system. Now, how, I'm sorry, how many megawatts is the battery storage for the new power plant? Uh, 20 megawatts, uh, 25 megawatts for 15 minutes or 15 megawatts. It's a, it's a, the storage capability is 15 megawatts over 30 minutes. Okay. And the reason for that, uh, you were explaining the reason for the, why the battery storage is necessary for the new power plant? Uh, in case you lose the generator, the batteries are going to hold you up there until you can turn on other generators. In, I'm, sorry, in, I'm sorry, in case what? You lose one of their generators or anything in the system, I see. it will hold the, the, keep the power on while you bring up other generators. And that's the, that's the problem we have today, you know, when we lose, like for example, over the weekend, we lost eight and nine. A lot of, of outages occurred. The batteries are gonna help you to alleviate that. And that's what makes this plan more reliable because, because in addition to having that battery, it's gonna have 64 megawatt of standby generator within, within the plan itself. So even this new uh, power plant will require battery storage, correct? Again, to control frequency, but okay. it, it doesn't, it's not used to, uh, what you call it, eliminate uh, 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 the capacity of the unit to provide you the 24-7 uh, power. Sure, okay, and thanks. Mr. I'd Senator, like to... could I just add to what John said? Sure. Uh, just, just one comment. Um, you, Senator Regine Pascoli brings up some interesting questions and really, we focus in on the 198 megawatt power plant, but this power plant, this, this new pr design, is something that, you know, I'd like to draw a distinction with, say, eight and nine. See, when we did eight and nine, and I quoted your price of five and a half cents, that didn't have anything to do with energy storage. It didn't recognize renewables. So we designed for a time when there was no renewables. This new power plant is designed for renewables, so it, that energy storage is there to help us add more renewables to the system. If you don't put this in, you're going to have a hard time adding more renewables to the system. And this is lessons learned from Kauai, lessons learned from the mainland. Everybody is going to shut down their coal plants, that's what they're doing in the mainland, and they are going to these kind of power plants burning ultra low sulfur diesel or liquefied natural gas to allow them to move towards renewables. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, also, you just mentioned Hawaii, and I know that they have passed a bill in the last few years to get to 100% renewable energy mm -hmm. uh, within a certain time. So what would you say that our mark is for 100% renewable for Guam? Senator, I, I visited the state of Hawaii, and in the state of Hawaii, there are two electric providers. One is called Hawaiian Electric, and they provide power to Oahu, Maui, and uh, Hawaii, city and county of those three islands. Right. The city and county of Kauai is uh, 
called the Kauai Electric Cooperative. And I asked all of those gentlemen, what does that 100% mean to you? And they all came back, we don't know. I said, what do you mean you don't know? He says, right now, Joey, it's not stable, it's not reliable, it's not 24-7. We're going to go there. Now, the two companies are different. One is a cooperative which, which serves its ratepayers. It's owned by the ratepayers, in other words. Sort of like what we are. And those folks are putting on more and more renewable. They have almost, they've limited their net, uh, their rooftop solar to 1% of their load, their, mat, their peak load. Their peak load is 70 megawatts. So they've limited rooftop solar to 1% of 70 megawatts. And they are putting in utility scale solar with batteries. They also have some very limited uh, hydropower, which is really good, but they are now retrofitting some of their generators. They're repowering, doing a lot of what we're doing, repowering. The other islands um, did something that I fought against doing here. There was a proposal once to do what they did. Hawaiian Electric got from their PUC uh, permission to decouple their rates. And decoupling your rates mean that what you consume has nothing to do with your bill. So that means that Hawaiian Electric goes into the PUC and says, these are all our costs. These are debt service. These are all our fixed costs. These are all the costs we have. And we have to recover these costs. So even if you're not staying in your house for, let's say, the whole month, you'll still pay yes, a you do. rate? Yes, you do. And that's why their rates are much higher. I can tell you that for the first block of rates, it's around 45 to 50 cents and going up because Hawaiian Electric just filed with their PUC again a motion to increase their decoupled rates. So that's something that we don't want to do because two things. But I also just feel, Mr. Chair, with all due respect, I just feel like at least they have a plan to get to 100. We don't even have a plan. And, and we're, and you know, the discussion and that we're, have, we're having here today signals to me that not only is there no plan, but there's no desire to get to a no. plan. There's no desire for that conversation. No, no, there is a desire and we do have a plan. We have moved forward and we are ahead of schedule to get to 25%. We are planning to go to 50%. The problem is we need to see how technology evolves over the next decade to see how much further you can go beyond that. I'm going to tell you that even in the mainland, nobody is, going, is, is up to say 50%, nowhere. Are they up to 50%? Yeah. Absolutely not. Right. They're not up but, to 50% fi today, but at least yeah. they have a plan to get they, there they somewhere are, in the future. And that's yeah. my point. That's just they, my yeah, point. Yeah, and we do too. We, somewhere in the future. Somewhere in the future, yeah. we do too. No, but they also have planted a flag in the ground and said, this is our date certain. We will, from here on, they we have, refuse to spend any money. We refuse oh to no. do any more bonds unless it's towards Senator, renewable that's not energy. True. And so, that's not true. I just visited Denton, Texas where they just invested in a plant like ours. Not the same design, but the same concept. They just invested in another plant, 225 megawatts, I believe. They just invested in this plant so that they can do more renewables. Chairman Reynes, I think we can go on all day, and I certainly want to give my colleagues well, the opportunity to ask you questions. You. Yeah, I'm only sharing with you all the research we've done. I don't want you to think that we haven't looked at it, we have looked at it, and we continue to look at it, and we are moving in that direction, Senator. Well, I look forward to having those conversations with sure. you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lee. Uh, for the record, I'd just like to point out that both Texas and Saudi Arabia, which are oil-rich uh, areas, are investing a lot in renewables. Uh, with that, I'd like to recognize Senator Tello Uh Thank you for uh, joining us today. Uh, Senator uh, Tidegui, I'd actually like to allow um, Senator Will Castro the opportunity to uh, ask no, questions at this no, time. No, I don't like that. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Senator Castro. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I was hoping that coming 10 minutes early would have some dividend. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity, uh, you know, given the heavy investment that's about to be made on behalf of the territory, certainly asking a few more questions of those who are charged to make that decision on our behalf uh, couldn't hurt. Uh, Mr. Chairman, all the discussion that's happened so far has been very technical, and I can appreciate that. I'm actually learning a lot. Uh, my question, since we're at the table, are a little more broad. Uh, the first question is, uh, you know, given the amount of the investment, um, you know, why now, why at this juncture? I, not yet, Mr. Benventi, maybe I can finish the first two questions, and then I'll defer to the chairman 
uh, if he'd like to have you answer or wait for the panel to present their testimony. So why, why the new and heavy investment at this juncture? That's the first question. And, and frankly, the second question is closely tied to uh, the previous speaker's concerns about renewables, uh, whether it's solar or thermal, or uh, as the chairman mentioned, even hydro. Uh, I'd like to know uh, further into the discussion what provisions to drill down, if I could use that term very loosely, what provisions within the negotiated contract will allow for this retrofitting. Mr. Chairman, aside from the obvious, I'm not a very technical person, you know, it's obvious that we have an abundance of sunlight. And then when Mr. Duenius mentioned that there's hydro, the opportunity for hydroelectric power generation, I'd like to also see how uh, that retrofitting um, component within the negotiated contract could be discussed further from my understanding. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have tremendous confidence in both the management team and the process. And so uh, I just received testimony from former Senator Sanchez and, and Mr. Beneventi. And so what I'd like to do is reserve my time, uh, give them the opportunity at, at the end of your discussion, Mr. Chairman, uh, to speak on their testimony. And then if I'm not satisfied with the, with the answers or the testimony, I'd like to go ahead and drill down further. Uh, Mr. Chairman, again, those were two very broad questions in terms of the investment and the option for re renewables to be integrated. Thank you. Uh, would you like to answer? They read me. Oh, I'm sorry. Could I just clarify one thing? I talked about renewables and uh, water uh, hydropower. I was saying that in Kauai, they do have some hydropower. We don't have the availability of hydropower here on Guam. Uh, we have looked at it. Uh, we have looked at the fact that could we put, say, for example, uh, at the Northern Wastewater Treatment Plant, we produce or we uh, treat about six million gallons or more a day, and then we send it down to the ocean, and there's a drop from that cliff line down to where it goes out to the ocean, and there was some look at seeing if we could maybe put a turbine down there so that as the water is going out to the ocean, it would turn the turbine. But as we looked at it, it's such a small amount, and we were trying to get grant money from uh, USD uh, Department of Energy, to see if they were funded and it's something we're still looking at. But that, that's what I'm trying to say. We don't really have hydro. In Kauai, they do have, uh, if you've been there, these deep canyons. And so they have some places where they are looking at that. We don't, unfortunately, have that ability. Just to clarify what I said. Senator Tidegui. Thank you. And, uh, Thank you everyone for being here today uh, for this oversight. And uh, what was interesting um, was the discussion on the insurance section of, of what happened at uh, the explosion at Cabarrus. And so, um, Mr. Beneventi, um, first I'd like to see that kind of information. You know, I, I don't know where the chairman, but I will ask the chairman where he, he got his information on uh, what this insurance company said happened they believe what happened. But if I'm not mistaken, Mr. Benevente, is there another independent uh, company that's coming to also do an assessment of what happened other than the insurance company um, putting the onus on East-West? Uh, is there another? Well, there was a study conducted by BWSC. Uh, it was hired as an independent contractor to uh, determine the root cause of the explosion. And again, that report, it was inconclusive. As well, so, so you have both sides. So this may just go to court to find out who's right or who's wrong. So it sounds like this investigation can go even further, correct? That's correct. It's okay. been the, between the parties now. Between the parties themselves. Okay, well, you know, when I, I was thinking to myself, when you're doing an RFP, you're sending one out, you, you put stipulations in an RFP. And I actually made a comment saying, well, Anybody who's in a suit, a lawsuit, or, or has been claimed that they did some wrongdoing uh, should not be in an RFP, well then, if that's the case, nobody would be filing for the RFP. That's like, right. for instance, mobile gas. How many times have they been sued? You know, how many times have they done oil spills and stuff, but yet we still use them? So I understand that, that certain circumstances that come into play is a lesson learned. So whatever outcome on this insurance, I'm hoping that uh, GPA takes those considerations and put um, 
best practices into place to address anything that should come up. And that brings it back to, good chairman uh, mentioned the backup generators um, with regards to uh, in the event the generator should go down, or I'm sorry, backup batteries for the generator in case it goes down, thus like what happened at Cabarrus. What is the responsibility of the contractor in this RFP? His responsibility in the event a generator should go down, inoperable, and the batteries kick, uh, the, you know, the battery to kick in, but what is responsible or the safety net that GPA has with this new contractor in the RFP? Uh, we have a lot of protection, uh, Senator, and actually I've noted it in, the, uh, in the, my presentation. Uh, of course, part of it is the, uh, they'll build, own, and operate, and then transfer this over 25 years. Funding, they have to provide 20% equity in that. There's bid guarantees, bid securities. There's uh, performance guarantees. Uh, if they have excessive outages, they pay a penalty. They have penalties for excessive outage, outages? That's, That's correct. That's good to know. That's yep. good to know. There's a dependable capacity. Their unit cannot meet the capacity that we're contracting for. There's penalties. Okay. Uh, liquidated damages is huge if they don't complete the power plan on time. There's a transfer of security, meaning on the 21st year, the 25th, they have to provide $15 million as an assurance that they will maintain, make sure the unit is maintained well, especially in the last part of the, uh, of the contract. And of course, there's other default provisions, not only which transfers it to the lending company to take initial action and then GPA thereafter. So there, there's a lot of, uh, one of the reasons why an independent power producing model is good for us is really it transfers all the risk uh, to the uh, proponent. And as long as we're paying our bills uh, on time, which we, we will, and we've done this now, uh, the first IPP for, uh, occurred uh, in, the, in the mid 90s, and that's why we have MEC 8 and 9 being transferred over to us at no cost. That's why we have TEMIS 7 came to us in 2017 at no cost. Mm -hmm. And then again, Tengisan Power Plan of, we, we, we was uh, retired. And just like this power plan, we're actually paying for it in a way so that in 25 years it belongs to us, and then it can serve us again for the next. Uh, 20, 25 years beyond that. That's good to know, John, because um, you know the there's money behind that. In other words, you know, put your money where your mouth is, and yep. I'm glad that you have those things in place, especially when it comes to um, any penalties, and right. and 15 million is quite a bit. So that's good to hear that it's in place. Um, the other question I have with regards to the RFP. Now, if I'm not mistaken, the RFP, when it was sent out, there was language in there that basically said technology neutral. Right. And when you're saying technology neutral, in my eyes, you're, you're assessing anything from renewables to ultra low to natural gases, anything under the sky. So when you had the, the RFP going out, you had how many people, um, well, first, with the RFP like that, te technology neutral means everything from renewables. Correct. So those who are submitting their, their um, proposals to GPA, can you tell me how many submitted proposals to GPA for this, um, this bid? Well, we started out again with this. Uh, is, this was a three-step process, looking at, again, their financial capability and the experience in building uh, power plants. So it was opened up and uh, we had 18 proponents that came in. 18. 18. From the 18, uh, seven were deemed qualified. Okay. Then the seven were provided the, the bid specifications with, you know, was approved by ourselves, of course, by also by the PUC. And that provided the uh, technology neutral. So all of the seven proponents, uh, four submitted proposals, 
and only three were uh, were evaluated te uh, technically, and the three provided, uh, two of them provided combined cycle units, and one provided uh, what they call internal co internal combustion units. That's that was what Sila, and basically those were the only three that came in. There was and no no. Uh, there was some part of it uh, renewable, but again, it was still a convention and conventional unit that came in. Okay. And of the three, one was awarded, correct? Uh, one is with the intent to award. The intent, okay. And again, subject to the CCU and the PUC. Okay. Was there any uh, protest by the, the second? There was a protest by the second uh, lowest dead person value. And... Uh, we denied the protest, explaining why uh, we believe they were wrong. And then they had 14 days to file with the OPA and appeal, and that did not happen. So, so they did not pursue their protest. That, that's correct. Okay, right. so that seems to be cleaned up there with regards to that. So the process looks like it was done correctly. Um, so I, I, I talked about the, the generator already on that. Uh, renewables. You know, if there's anybody who is a big advocate, right, <laughs> I'm getting a wink from my good friend over there, Mr. Cruz, uh, is ultra low sulfur diesel. And moving forward with the ultra low sulfur diesel and natural gases, there was a question I, that was brought up earlier about retrofitting, you know, um, the power plant. But if you have RFPs that are coming in and you're putting technology, uh, you're putting the, the word technology neutral, and finding the best opportunities. Right now, we're looking at ultra low and natural. So hopefully, maybe in the future, as things progress, you know, there there can be some kind of retro, and to find out if it is cost uh, savings as well as environmentally friendly green. Now, the one question I had to, and I have just two more, is how is GPA protected uh, with this contract? But I think you spoke a little bit about the battery backup, the requirement if there is any type of, um, you know, uh, if the, the plant should break down or anything like that. But can you give me just a roundabout way of how is GPA protected with this contract that, that you see is very important and vital? Uh, again, uh, you're correct. The, really, there's a lot of protection within the contract itself. It's a bill own, operate, and transfer, meaning they're responsible for the machine to maintain it and to meet the performance guarantees, not only in outages, number of outages, but also in efficiency. So all of this are provided in there, and if they don't, uh, if they don't succeed, then they get penalized, and we don't pay for, it, for that scenario. Uh, again, they're also required to provide, uh, like you said, skin in the game, like 20% of the, of the total project has to be in, from their equity, from their money. So therefore, you know, they're going to have to protect that investment. Uh, the plan in itself really is, uh, I'm, I'm quite uh, pleased with because it does have the battery storage and doesn't depend on us on the outside to put in a separate battery. Then they have another uh, 64 megawatts of, di of uh, diesel generators to back themselves up, which means we don't have to depend also on all our standby generators out in the system. And therefore, all of that is within, within the cost that it, we're being charged. So therefore, it also allows us the opportunity to re reduce costs, to look at retiring other uh, standby generators and reducing the cost to the rate payers. So this opportunity is there, and certainly it's something we're going to work further once we do have the uh, contract, uh, you know, approved for a power plan. Because uh, again, like the chairman also said earlier, there's still an opportunity to look at all of these ways all these other cost factors to try and make that uh, issue about the base rate, uh, uh, you know, come true. But the, the really the important thing about all of this is there's four major reasons, Senator. One, the AIDS plan, we can only run so much longer. Two, US EPA says you have to be compliant, and 
you know, it's been, we're, we've been out of compliance uh, for since 2013, and that's several hundred million dollars of potential penalties that we're trying to work a consent decree on, and it's, you know, coming close to that. Three, the lo there's a load growth upon us. With what capacity we have today, 1% load growth is all we can uh, manage in the next three years. Beyond that, you know, we, military, uh, the marine base comes here, and I think we're going to have issues. And, uh, and then four, really, we have contracted for uh, 120 megawatts already, 120,000 kilowatts of um, renewables coming on the line in 2022. That's at eight and a half cents a kilowatt hour, one of the lowest that you know uh, thing. And but we know that we can add any more renewables unless we have the proper machine that works with this. Because renewables were not there when oh everyone was building base load or dump trucks, if you will, that will carry a big load, but will only carry it at its base. Today we need Camaros or something that will jump up and down and, and work with this uh, renewables. So we have, you know, it's been planned since 2014, moving forward. And here, it's not that we don't want to go to 100% renewables, it's just that to keep the lights on in an isolated community and keep the power going and keep the economy and security, we have to do it at a reasonable and technically a feasible way to do it. Here's a, an example under McKinsey, McKinsey, excuse my, uh, sometimes I can't pronounce all of this. Renewables in Germany, they're trying to get away and do a lot of that, but they're finding energy security as an issue. Energy security means they don't have enough backup. They're finding that they're paying a lot more for other sources. They, have, they can tie into other grids in Europe, no? but it costs them more. So all of these issues have to be worked out even with the best of them. Uh, let's talk about, uh, again, uh, battery storage. There have been quite a few of battery storage explosions. So that is even being, uh, what you call it, redesigned and re-looked uh, at. It's an, it's an evolution that's occurring. So again, we don't want to be in the front end of the, we're putting along, no, actually we're moving quite along. We're going to have 25% in 2023 at the latest, and we're trying to achieve 50% before the 2035, but I think in the, in the 2030s, but you should get our 50% of renewables if we get this new power plan. If we don't get the new power plan, uh, I'm sorry, I, no, I just, uh, I just uh, don't see that uh, happening. No? Thank, thank you, John, for that. Um, you know, I, I just have one more question, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry, I, just one more. And this one is uh, something that it's called the Integrated Resource Plan that was submitted in 2013, the IRP. And it was submitted to PUC. I'm glad to see someone representing PUC is here. And then uh, later on in 2000, uh, 15 PUC requested for you to do an upgrade on the IRRP. Can you please explain what the IRP is? The IRP is an integrated resource plan that's used by the utility and all, most utilities to plan out the energy future. How would you supply the energy needs of your, of your customers going forward? You look at the existing equipment that you have, you look what's out there that's available, and you try to, to match the, uh, what can uh, match that into a system to provide the least cost to your customer. So integrated resource plan way back in 2011, 2012, actually thought about more renewables, looking at uh, uh, combined cycle units with, uh, that could burn both ultra low sulfur diesel and also natural gas because the differential between diesel or oil and natural gas has been consistently there. In fact, that, that, uh, that, that uh, differential between them is going to be wider, meaning natural gas becomes more important. So, so that integrated resource plan is what we, we submit to the PUC for approval. And so again, 
the PUC allowed us to go out for renewables. Therefore, that's why we have the 25 megawatt out there in uh, Danden. And that's why we have awarded last year in 2018 120 megawatts of eight and a half cents kilowatt to come on the line in 2022. And then the third part of that is the 40 megawatt that we're under bid now that we will be awarded by the end of the year. So all of that is a part of the integrated resource plan. And again, it's a living document, if you will. You keep on putting in what you have and see how can you best meet the, the future needs. So when's that's the integrated resource plan. When's the last time, the, because according to PUC, they requested you in 2015 for an up, update of this IRFP. So is there one, because that's four years ago, do you have a new one up? That's correct. We updated it in uh, at the request of the PUC as a result of the Cabot 3 and 4 explosion to update the plan. Because prior to that in 2014, uh, the CCU had filed for the construction of 120 to 100 megawatt new power plant. And so after the explosion of the Cabos 3, the PUC o ordered us to go ahead and uh, update that, which we did in 25, uh, 2016, and which they subsequently approved in October 2016 for us to go out for a bid for 120, 180 megawatt power plant. So again, all of this process that we've been going through have always had the CCU and the, the PUC uh, oversight. So again, here, uh, you know, we've, it's been, we've had to go through this process for not only that, but also for the land, buying all of this. Then the bid process, all the big documents. And then now we have to go now for the approval of the uh, of the lowest bidder. So that's where we are, Senator, with the CCU approving, and now uh, we're before the PUC. And then subsequent, once we update, once we know that that is the new power plan that's going to be a part of our mix, then we update the IRP now. How much more renewables can we add to the system, and how do we get the least cost uh, to the customers? Okay. But, you know. Well, thank you so much, John. I appreciate it. And thank you, Mr. Chair, for the thank opportunity. You. Thank you, Senator. Senator Moylan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So with our current renewable contracts, can you explain to me what, what's the prices with our existing renewable contracts, please? The, uh, tw the first contract, again, this happened when the prices of oil were $110 a barrel compared to the 70 today. And that was for 20 cents a kilowatt hour from the Danden facility, a 20-year contract beginning 2015. Then last year, we bid 120, and it's coming in at eight and a half cents. So when you look at the, uh, what you have now, which is 15 cents on your LIAC, that eight and a half cents energy is gonna go into the LIAC and reduce uh, cost. And then the third bid that's out now, uh, the price proposal will be somewhere before the end of the year. And that now is energy storage, because we can, only, we can only take so much energy in the daytime without having to shut down all the generators. Because you can, you know, the people, uh, the customers ask for load, and either you supply with conventional or renewables, but you cannot do both at the same time uh, uh, in terms of the report capacities there. So, if we're going to do whole 100%, we have to shut off all the generators, which is not a stable system. So therefore, they call it a dock curve. We're going to only back off the, the generators so much and let renewables generate and come into the system, but the balance of it, we have to catch in batteries and then use that in the evening and early morning to start shaving more and more of the conventional load. Now that's coming in before the end of the year, so we won't know what the price range will be. I'm hoping it's somewhere around 12, 12 cents a kilowatt hour. And that starts to be a good model for us to utilize to, to go out for more. And we can go out for more once we have the power plant approved and we know it's coming in in 2022, 2023. Then we know we'll have a conventional system that could work with a lot of renewables so therefore, we can go out and contract for more renewables to come in shortly thereafter. But until we make this decision today, 
you just don't have the capacity to, to add more renewables. That's okay, if, if you were to contract eventually with, for more renewables, would this require you to have more real estate? Actually, the, the, our power purchase agreements are, it's the proponent that is required to have the renew, uh, to get the real estate itself. So they would have to uh, contract. So all we're doing, and again, it's no risk to us, all we're doing is buying the energy. We're contracting to buy that energy at a certain rate, escalated at a very low escalating factor for 20 years. Because there's another factor here that we talk about renewables. For a renewable farm, there's actually kind of a life of that renewable farm. You're talking about probably 20 years, maybe 25 years, and then you're basically going to have to rebuild the facility or check what's the new technology. It doesn't go 30, 40 uh, or plus years as conventional energy does. So the conventional energy we put today will be around even when renewables are, are changing uh, for, uh, because they do degrade, they do degrade in, in, uh, in production uh, over time and they do have finite lives, even batteries have finite lives and all of that. So, you know, it's a, it's a really uh, evolving technology. But, but yes, we're looking at more and more and, and the real estate center that's really up to the, to the private uh, sector. We're going to facilitate that with more transmission lines, so therefore there's less money being put in by the proponent on transmission line, but just generating power into the grid. And all of that goes right to the, uh, to the rate pair. Let's talk about, if I may just mention uh, perhaps, how many acres of land does it take to uh, how many acres of land is required to, in, uh, for renewables to generate the energy for one day that this 100, 200 megawatt power plant uh, could do? It's going to take about 3,400 acres. No? In addition to that, I estimated, based on price experience, you're talking about $3.2 billion of investment by those proponents to achieve a one day operation. If you're gonna do an, a second day, you're gonna need battery storage. So that's, this is, that is not inclusive of battery storage. For battery storage, it's about $500,000 a, a megawatt. Uh, for, it, it's very expensive yet, it's coming down, but it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, it, and we hope to catch that curve. But again, 3,400 acres to get you to one day of 100%. And then, just like we back up conventional machines, you gotta back it up with batteries if you wanna stay re uh, renewables. And, you know, it's a, it's a big amount. That's why we're taking a step at a time. No? Okay, uh, just one other question, Mr. Chair. So with the, uh, with the power plant proposal and then the wastewater uh, system, the upgrades that they're doing there. Can you just uh, summarize how this will integrate with the power plant, please? The, the power plant, for example, the technology where you have a steam turbine, it's like the Cabras 1 and 2. You require cooling of the condenser to, ten, to, turn, the, uh, and turn, uh, to turn the steam back to water and recirculate it in a closed loop. So that's what's happening in Cabras Power Plant. We use ocean water to cool, and then on the other side, we have to get a permit from US EPA to do that. With the new power plant, it's going to use cooling towers, and it's going to take about 3 million gallons a day from the 6 million of waste of, uh, uh, of uh, effluent from the wastewater treatment plant. It's going to take that after a second, after it's treated, we're going to retreat it and use that for evaporative cooling of the power plant. So we're not going to use the ocean anymore. And then we're eliminating dumping 3 million gallons of water, of, uh, of effluent out into the ocean. So we're, again, as part of the sustainable uh, efforts, uh, you know, of the new power plant. So better for the environment. 
That's great. And then we're not pulling three million gallons a day from the from the aquifer. Even Cabers, if it's retired, you're going to save that amount of, one, more, of water that they're pulling from the system today. It's going to basically, you know, that's more water for for uh, the use by the consumers of Guam. So. Thank you. Good plan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Moylan. I'd also like to recognize Senator Sabina Perez. And uh, Senator Perez, do you have any questions? Uh, yes, I do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so just a question about uh, permits. Um, what are the permits that are required for the construction of the power plant? Well, of course, you have uh, air permits or any discharges that will have to be made from the power plant. That's all required. You have uh, not only the uh, you have local uh, regulations and also federal regulations. And part of the Clean Air Act requires, uh, uh, again, uh, any new facility to be, uh, to be permitted by US EPA. So just to kind of list them, uh, can you name what some of the permits? Yeah, the operating permit is, is one. Uh, I'll, I'll have to get you a list, Senator. I don't have it all in my mind. Um, and aside from, and again, that's aside from other local government permits for construction, clearing, all of those other things. But, but for sure, the plan cannot be permitted unless US EPA uh, permits the plan. Is there anybody here who can answer that question regarding the type of um, environmental permits? We, we can send it to you, the listing, sir. Okay. Is the um, NDPS permit, is that one of them? That's National Pollution Discharge Elimination System. Uh, that's for the Cabras Power Plant. That's the use of the ocean water through the condensers out to Upper Harbor. And that's the one we're going to be eliminating once we retire Cabras 1 and 2. There will be none of that except perhaps some of the waste coming that will go back to the wastewater treatment plant at the, at, uh, the, at the northern wastewater treatment plant. So that's being worked out with, uh, uh, with our, we'll be working out with GWA and the uh, US EPA for the small volume of water that comes back from the power plant. Are there any Sorry, please, please turn on the microphone and, uh, and state your name for the record. Uh, John Cruz. I am the uh, Assistant General Manager of uh, Engineering and Technical Services. Okay. The plant is anticipated to be uh, permitted as a minor source, meaning there should be very, very little uh, uh, recourse to go to US EPA. That can be done locally. Sorry, can you repeat that into the mic? I can't okay. hear you. you it, it, the, the plant will be permitted as a minor source for, for, air, for, for, for air permitting. The, uh, the plant will be permitted as a minor source, meaning it will be, the, the permit for that would be, uh, have to go to Guam EPA rather than US EPA. Uh, there, there, uh, there, there will have to be an environmental impact assessment, right? So, uh, uh, there are also permits for the uh, archaeological, uh, uh, the, 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 the SHPO uh, considerations. Uh, there will probably need to be a look at, uh, at, uh, at, uh, at, at water, clean water permits as well, since it's sitting uh, about uh, near the aquifer, not over the aquifer. Okay? So the... Uh, we can get you a, a better list of that, but that's in, in essence, we'll run the full gamut of all permitting that is necessary both locally and, and federally. Uh, so that includes stormwater discharge? Stormwater discharge, the, the SVCC requirements, the, uh, the, 
the B, B, BMP requirements, which are both for uh, SVCC is really for the, the, uh, for the spillage of any fuel, especially oil, right? And the BMP is sorry, for anything you, that goes into the stormwater. The, sorry, the Mr. Cruz, can you state the acronym? Can you um, at least state what the acronym stands no, for? No, if, if there should ever be SVCC, right, is spill prevention. Oh, okay. okay. And that's spill, spill prevention for, for fuel. Okay, so that needs to be taken care of. Uh, we need to have an SVCC plan, and it needs to be uh, approved by, by, uh, by EPA. The BMP, right, is, is for discharges to the sewer. So anything that goes into the sewer, right, or the, or the, or the stormwater or whatever, needs to be undergo that kind of uh, uh, review and come up with a BMP plan. Excuse me, Mr. Cruz, what does BMP stand for? I, what would it be? I believe BMP stands for Best Management Plan. Yeah. Okay, that's required for which, which permit? It's, it's required to uh, uh, comply with all the clean water okay. provisions. And as far as the NDPES, uh, is that also one of the permits that? The National Prevention of uh, Deterioration, Significant uh, Deterioration. Pollution Discharge, yes. Is that also one of the permits? Uh, we will not be discharging into the ocean, right? So any 316B type uh, permitting will not be required. Okay. And when you said the environmental impact statement, um, so would that require public input? Uh, can that you explain that, that process? That always requires public input. Okay. Is this the federal? Is it, are we talking about the NEPA law? The federal NEPA law. <clears throat> is this the environmental impact statement that we're all very familiar with? Yeah, with the it? Navy. Yeah. Uh, it, it will be up to KEPCO's, uh, uh, all of the, all the permitting, right, is the responsibility of, of KEPCO. Mm -hmm. Right? So whatever they negotiate with EPA, that, that's what they will be required to do. Can you explain that process more? I'm not familiar with that. I'm, I'm, it seems a little bit, um, you know, when a company negotiates an EIS, how does that work? Uh, I, I am not as familiar on that, uh, on, the, on that, but they will have to hire a consultant that will have to be working, work them through the, the permitting process. And, and we've met with uh, Guam EPA a few weeks ago to get them started on that process. So but it's really, it's really between them and Guam EPA and US EPA. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, so the other question, oh, thank you, Mr. Cruz. Um, the other question I have is um, total cost of ownership. So regarding the construction of the, the power plant, has there been an analysis of the total cost of ownership in regards to maintenance costs, warranties, cost of field failure, environmental impacts, insurance, inspection costs, insulation costs, risk management and safety, financing upgrades, parts and repairs. Has this analysis been done? Well, the bid in itself covers all of that. Uh, it's under the fixed capacity fee, the fixed O&M fee, variable O&M fee. Uh, that that's all covered and uh, covers all that cost and then again and for and that's set for and that's uh, worked out for the uh, term of the contract so they make all the investments necessary to make the power plan to complete the power plan can you explain the variable o and m fee Variable one and fee is the amount of water that they use or anything that's variable. It depends if they're not generating electricity, there's no consumption. But if they are and they use water to cool the, the plant, uh, you know, we're going to have to pay for water from GWA or the, even the effluent water. So those are variable costs. What other variables were considered? 
oil, uh, lubrication oil, anything that anything that has to do that again is a function of the amount of energy you produce. An example of variable cost would be for, for instance, uh, up at the uh, Greco power plant up in Jiga, they use urea to, uh, to, uh, as, a, as a part of their controls for, for NOx. As they run, they use urea, so that's a variable cost. They don't, use, they don't use urea while the plant is standing down. So it's only those costs which are, uh, which are incurred when the plant is running and producing energy. Okay. So we're talking consumables, material consumables. consumables. Yes. Okay. Um, what about uh, just the, you know, you know, we live on, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about that pipeline running through Marine Drive uh, over the Maui well. Um, so there is, it is going over the aquifer. Um, and so I'm just concerned about that pipeline running underneath Marine Drive. And, you know, we live on Guam with, there's a lot of earthquakes here. Um, you know, has there been thought given to ruptures in the pipeline and the cost of actually fixing that? So that's the type of cost I'm also concerned about is yeah. that, um, you know, the insurance cost of that, um, repair, damage to the environment, and the, how many miles of that are we talking about? That's uh, 15 miles, uh, Senator. And there is one existing pipeline there that operated from 1974 to uh, 19, uh, 2015 that fed that power plant. So we're using the same right of way and all of that. They will construct the pipeline and then turn it over to GPA for its operation and maintenance. And that will, of course, we will have insurance coverage that will be taken care of on the insurance, uh, GPA insurance port part of it. The proponent will, will be responsible for uh, everything within the fence line, which is the power plant. Outside of that, the transmission facilities, the pipelines, that will be a GPA responsibility. Has there been any records as far as uh, damage to that pipeline or leakage of that in the history of the use of that pipeline? I think there was one way back uh, over in Ordut that was cleaned up and all that. So, and again, that was, so the pipeline being constructed will certainly, uh, I believe it's double, right? it's a double wall. And again, to alleviate this type of uh, leakage, so you can see it ahead of time, and it don't leak right out to the uh, to the environment. The initial pipeline built in 1974. That's just one one wall pipeline. And what's the insurance cost of that um, to for that pipeline? Well. Right now, Senator, we, we spend four, almost five million a year to cover all our facilities. But most of that is really the power plant itself, which we expect to go down because we really won't have covers one and two anymore. And then that insurance cost of the new power plant is covered by uh, KEPCO. They will be the one that have to insure uh, that facility. You know that. So the pipeline outside is is it shouldn't it shouldn't drive our insurance costs out. There'll be a reduction of our total costs. Has there been um, an assessment done for a power plant that's closer to the source, uh, so the port, versus placing it up uh, near the high density living areas, near a hospital, near a Micronesia Mall? Is there been another assessment done for a, diff a different site that uh, may not impact a greater portion of the population? Well, we, we did that uh, back when we were looking for the land senator. We had many presentations, many discussions on that. The reason why you, you're trying to move it away from the port area is in case, uh, of course, you have still potentials with all the changes in the environment, uh, potentials for tsunamis that could take out the whole island's energy grid and all of that. Putting it up there in Okudo, you're protecting the facility. That's why the facility itself uh, will have 30 days of fuel supply 
you have seven days of water supply so that we can continue uh, providing energy to, uh, through the whole system. It's right into the grid. Uh, it saves uh, online losses, tremendous amount. It allows us to eliminate the transmission line that goes through the mountains all the way through uh, Sinahanya, all the way into the, uh, again, towards Aganya. So again, uh, that was, uh, you know, a lot of the discussions that went through when we, we tried to get the property for Okudu, which we subsequently, uh, subsequently bought for about $10 million for 60 acres there in uh, in uh, Okudu. The plant itself is going to take around 25 to 30 acres. The balance of the property is going to be used to buffer ourselves so that they uh, between ourselves and our neighbors. Uh, it's clean, clean uh, fuel, therefore clean emissions. There was, you know, so it's certainly uh, much more cleaner than what's happening today down in the Cabra Speedy area who's been, you know, in that area has been, again, has been absorbing uh, the, the uh, high sulfur RFO for since the 1950s and all of that. So they too will also get clean air with the conversion of MEC 8 and 9 to ultra low sulfur diesel. Senator, if I could add to that, uh, the, the, if I could just add, uh, we've, we've looked at these plants in the mainland. We've gone to different locations. They are located uh, next to schools, next to housing areas. There's a plant in Burbank, California, just to the west of I-5 that has, I've been to personally, and they have schools, housing developments, uh, shopping areas, all around, you can't tell the plant. It looks just like another industrial facility. And th that plant that I visited didn't have a buffer zone. It was, you know, you walked on the sidewalk and you can just walk right next to it. So these plants are designed to be safe and, and pollutant free. And like I said, you know, I personally saw this plant in, uh, the, the one that came to my mind today is Burbank, California, just to the west of I-5. And when we were driving up, I was looking around and said, hey, there's a school there. Just, just to give you a frame of reference, Senator. Thank you. And as far as the output of greenhouse gases, um, would that, uh, so I, I understand that um, uh, GPA is addressing the uh, uh, nitrous oxide, sulfur dioxide releases, but uh, has there been plans to address the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, when I know, understand that Guam, I'm sorry, US EPA is determining a level. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if they have already for plants in the US. Um, but is this plant going to uh, think, uh, I guess, plan for the future, that future when uh, US EPA does require um, protections from greenhouse gas emissions? The regulation of greenhouse gases, right, uh, during the Obama administration was the Clean Power Plan, the CCP. And the Clean Power Plan, specifically for Guam, Guam has an exemption and so do all the insular territories. Uh, in, in June, uh, as alluded by the Post, there was changes uh, in the Trump EPA and they've one rescinded in, uh, the Clean Power Plan, and they have put in something called the Affordable uh, Clean Energy Rule, which applies to coal plants, right? So from the regulatory perspective, the only requirement for GPA has been to really just the inventory of greenhouse gases. But uh, years ago, around 2015, we've met with uh, Ben Mackle and, uh, uh, and Mike, uh, Michael Mann of US EPA Region 9, where they explained to us, here's what the Clean Power Plan was. We explained our strategy in the in Integrated Resource Plan, and they realized that we will have met 
the requirements of the Clean Power Plan without having been even uh, subject to it, which is about a 35% reduction from 2010, uh, 2010 emissions, right? Through our strategy of going clear to, to LNG, which is about a third less uh, greenhouse gas, right, and, uh, and, and renewable energy. So we are taking matters as a whole strategy, not including, in, including the new power plant, plus our renewable posture, to reduce greenhouse gases quite a bit. Just one more question. Yeah, so I'm just thinking, you know, we're seeing our neighboring islands being inundated due to climate change. And I think that it's really critical as an island ourselves um, that we, probably t we should probably take a stronger role in this aspect. Um, and whether, I, I, you know, I'm, my gut feeling is that the national requirements are not strong enough for our needs. And, you know, I guess my ask to GPA is can we do better in regards to reducing our greenhouse gas emissions? Okay, so... Uh, so uh, yes, Senator. We continue to do better and we plan to do better. The more we add renewables, the more we reduce and use that as supplementary energy, the less we consume fuel oil. Uh, there's also another part of that clean gas, uh, uh, gas emissions that would help the climate change. And it really comes down to the different individuals, the consumption utilizing more energy efficient equipment. The largest, the largest uh, impact from uh, greenhouse gases, from my understanding, is transportation. Reducing the amount of fuel that they use by more efficient use, getting electric vehicles, hybrid uh, uh, vehicles. It's really also a consumer scenario. It's not just the utility. The utility can reduce its greenhouse and then by providing electricity which, uh, uses, which emits less of those gases to the transportation industry, that could help solve, uh, contribute greatly to greenhouse gases. So it's really a community effort, not just a GPA effort to get to that. No? Mr. Benaventi, I, I agree with you that, you know, transportation is a big part of it, but what's the point of having an electric vehicle if it were being powered by a dirty power plant? The, the point is you're, you're consuming less for the same amount of energy that the, everyone uses. It's efficiency, and that's, what, that's why uh, another case in point, we're offering rebates for demand site management programs. We all love our air conditioning here but you can reduce the amount of consumption you use by getting energy efficient equipment. That reduces the amount of greenhouse gases which we burn, because we're only supplying the energy that the consumer uh, uh, demands. And so therefore, by that way, that's how you reduce. Now again, if we emit, we may not emit zero, but we totally decrease our greenhouse gases. We can help the transportation industry but uh, by, uh, who is a hundred percent consumer reduce that? So it's a it's a relative uh, amount. It doesn't eliminate it completely. I, I understand what you're saying, and I don't want to speak for my colleague Senator Paris, but I, I I can understand and appreciate where she's coming from, and I think what she's trying to maybe ask is why can't we do both? Why can't we try to do our part individually, but also our part as a government and as a and we, and power provider. We will. We continue to do so, and, and we will uh, move forward. Uh, just help me get the new power plant on, and you see a lot more happening, especially with renewables. That's that's what I can I can say. All right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Benaventi. There are some members of the public who have signed up to to also provide some testimony. I'd like to afford them that opportunity now, as we are coming up on time uh, with this oversight hearing. So, uh, members of the public who would. Members of the public who would like to testify, um, some who have signed up, are they, st uh, let me see if they're still here first. Is there a Mr. Kyle Dehilik, uh, Joni Kerr, and um, Tony or Tani Guzman? Uh, 
And any member, any other members of the public who would like to testify? Mr. Dehilik. Thank you. Hoffaday Oversight Committee, GPA, uh, Consolidated Commission, Commissions on Consolidated Utilities, and all of Guam. My name is Kaya Dehilik. I'm 18 years old, and I turn 19 later this month. I'm a resident of Dedido, and I attend the University of Guam as a college freshman. As a former Youth Congress representative for Ukudu High School, and as the former chairman for the Committee on Land and Environment, I introduced bills and resolutions that would protect our lands and waters. And they passed unanimously. My internship with Sea Grant started about three hours ago, but I asked to come in late today to provide my opinion on the development of a new fossil fuel power plant in Dedido. I oppose the approval, construction, and the idea of a new fossil fuel power plant on Guam and anywhere in the world. In short, fossil fuels are bad because over geologically relative short time, overconsumption leads to more waste than the earth can handle. And currently, we humans demand too much energy than the earth can replenish that at a certain but near point, geological time frame, we will run out of what we have. And at the same time, causing our planet to trap in more carbon emissions further increasing the global temperature, and which leads us to what we all know it as, the climate crisis or climate change. So far in environmental biology, I learned that our history is what brought us to where we are today. And it is a great indicator for where we might be tomorrow. I have some oversimplified historical data that supports this. Martin Luther King Jr. protested the inequality of racial discrimination and today we have civil rights. Susan B. Anthony led the fight for women's suffrage, and consequently, women have the right to vote. Malala Yousafzai fought for human equality, especially for women and children, and she blazes the trail for access to education for women across the globe. Greta Thunberg skipped school one day, stood outside the Swedish parliament, and demanded her government to take action against the climate crisis. And on September 20, 2019, she empowers a global force of youth from all nations in calling for a global strike against the climate crisis. If history has ever proven itself, we can reasonably conclude that when the people demand for change by their governments, the people will win. Like Martin Luther King Jr., Susan B. Anthony, Malala Yousafzai, the fight against the climate crisis will prevail but I'm here to also offer alternatives. I believe that instead of building a fossil fuel power plant, we can invest in cleaner energy, such as nuclear energy, harnessing the power of our ocean currents, or biofuel. Although some may argue that nuclear energy is unsafe, the risk that fossil fuel power plants give is much more expensive to our health, biodiversity, and innovation. New technology has been developed since the last permanent nuclear power plant operated in the U.S. in 1997. It is 2019, and more than 20 years of innovation of new and cleaner energy. To some, the dollar bill is their reason as to why they might justify the construction of a new fossil fuel power plant over alternatives, because they believe it is cheaper financially and it is convenient. But for anyone who understands the basics of economics, the dollar bill is subjective, and its value is dependent on the economy and inflation rates. But if you ask me how much it would cost to build a nuclear power plant, I would argue that the construction of a fossil fuel power plant will cost you more land, more biodiversity, my trust, and my vote. I would ask you how many habitats would you destroy, how many animals, organisms, microorganisms, 
would you forcibly relocate or kill off? How much of my future are you willing to take away from me? To the Consolidated Commission on Utilities and GPA, I grieve my disappointment in you, and I will, will remember that in 2020. To the committee, I ask that you take this very seriously and support our people and wildlife by rejecting fossil fuels and dirty energy. Because your life depends on it, my life depends on it, and our future depends on it. Sizuas Maasi, Maraming Salama Po, and Kiniso. Thank you. Ma'am? Uh, please introduce uh, yourself for the record. Half a day. My name is Jonita Kangakur, and I am a teacher at Guam Community College and a faculty advisor for the GCC Eco Warriors. Um, I'm here to testify um, in opposition to the power plant. Um, I think that at Guam, as is possibly the largest producer of greenhouse gases in Micronesia, and I think that we owe it to our neighbors to set an example and do better with respect to um, our choice of energy sources. And um, I, I commend um, the senators for holding this oversight hearing to ensure that, um, that, that we go along the right path. Um, <clears throat> I do have um, questions that go back to the contract, however. Um, as we know, contracts are a two-way street. And so we've heard some uh, comments from um, GPA, the CCU, that the uh, company involved with the contract is, will be subject to penalties if they don't produce, uh, if they don't live up to the expectations of the contract. But I would like to know, what would, do, are there any potential penalties to Gov Guam, to its people, if we don't live up to our end of the contract? I would like to know, you know, have a whole, a better idea of what is in this contract. Um, I also note that the, the contract goes for 25 years and we are locked into a, where we would be locked into an ultra low sulfur fuel, um, that would be the, that would be the only choice. Um, and I would like to know who would they designate as a supplier or suppliers of this fuel? It seems like 25 years is a long time to commit to this one source um, or this, this source of fuel. I understand it's cleanest next to liquid LNG, but I'm just curious about um, the supplier for the fuel. Um, also, I have concerns about the business practices of the Korean Power Consortium, um, KEPCO. They are going through some uh, money, money woes and suits, lawsuits. They, are, they have questionable business practices. Um, and I am wondering also, since KEWP is being sued by uh, an insurance company that insured Cabot's one and two, is, do, does the CCU anticipate any issues with them, with them obtaining insurance from companies, other companies? I, I would be um, wary of, if I were an insurance company, wary of um, insuring a company that had these money problems and uh, involved with a company that um, is charged or being um, sued for an explosion here. And um, also, uh, Michelle Vocalo, who is the founder of uh, Micronesian Climate Change Alliance, she could not be here, she's off island. And she wanted the Oversight Committee to have access to articles that she's collected, compiled, um, regarding um, KEPCO. And I would like to present this to the committee. Sure, yes. Uh, you can uh, hand that to uh, my staff and we'll enter that. <coughs> uh, thank you. That's all I have today. Thank you. Mr. Sanchez? Yeah. Thank you, Senator. And good morning, Senators. <clears throat> 
So Juice Massey for the opportunity <clears throat> in this legislative hearing to hear from the public, GPA and members of the CCU about our recent decision to approve a contract with KEPCO to provide new generation on Guam. As part of my testimony, I wanted to first provide a recent letter from the general manager of the Kauai Island U Utility Cooperative, KIUC, uh, a letter he wrote to his ratepayers when Kauai was faced with load shedding despite significant renewable energy resources being available. I attach this letter because Kauai has more renewable energy currently operating. Uh, it is an isolated island system uh, and it is very aggressive in trying to, they're going to try to reach 70% renewable energy by 2030 and they're already ahead of us. <clears throat> um, this summer they had some unfortunate mix of weather circumstances and it resulted in, in some load shedding. They, they figured it out, but the general manager, Mr. Bissell, then wrote this letter to his rate, rate payers. And I've, I've attached it, but I, I want to just go to some of the key sections of, of the letter because I, I think it captures the, the honest questioning and of whether this is the right, right decision for our rate payers. So, he, he, from his letter, July 30th, 2019, he said, I'm often asked when will KIUC decommission its diesel fueled power plants and shift completely to renewable energy? The, the answer is, Mr. Bissell's answer, the answer is probably not for a long time. Absent a breakthrough in technology, we will need to maintain a significant fleet of conventional generators to cover our needs during abnormal weather patterns, be it a hurricane, typhoon, extended periods of rain, or other natural occurring events. As a standalone grid on the most isolated landmass on the planet, the challenge of delivering reliable power 24 hours a day, seven days a week is enormous, but it must be met. We, Kauai, are in fact currently leading the state and much of the nation in renewable penetration at 55%. At the same time, we're learning that it's imperative to maintain a diverse portfolio of power generation sources, both conventional and renewable, to reliably meet our members' energy needs. This was never clearer than during last week's island-wide outage and the days that followed. KIUC has 209 megawatts, 210 megawatts of generating capacity, more than half of which is renewable, a combination of solar, utility scale and distributed, just like we have on Guam, biomass, which we don't have on Guam, and hydropower, which we don't have on Guam. So when two of our three largest diesel generating units failed, why didn't the renewables pick up the slack? With 118 megawatts of generating capacity, our renewables should have been able to carry Kauai's 75 megawatt load. The answer is as simple as a lack of sunshine. On a sunny day, while renewable energy sources are often producing enough power to meet 90%, 90% or more of the island's power needs. These best systems, these battery systems that are provided by Tesla and AES, these battery systems are busy storing more than 150 megawatt hours of electricity for later use. The problem is when the sun doesn't shine, these solar energy resources provide minimal output and our hydropower and biomass facilities can only meet a fraction of our load. So let me repeat that. The problem is when the sun doesn't shine, these solar energy resources provide minimal output. So while we strive on a daily basis to maximize our use of clean renewable power, which by the way is less expensive than diesel, we must also face the reality that when the sun doesn't shine or the water doesn't flow, our renewables need a backup. Reliable and low cost generating resource options that do not rely on solar are limited for our island. No one is really sure how the challenge of moving completely off of fossil fuels while maintaining reliability standards will be met. KIUC is committed to meeting the state's mandate, main, mandate Hawaii wants to get 100% by 2045. KIUC is committed, committed to meeting the state's mandate and has set its own goal of reaching 70% by 2030. Fortunately for KIUC and our members, we are moving quickly and learning valuable lessons along the way. KIUC is a member-owned cooperative serving 33 customer accounts on the island of Kauai. It is, for, it is uh, governed by a nine-member elected board of directors. It has gone from 10% renewable generation in 2010 to more than 50% in 2019. 
and leads the energy, leads the nation in energy storage watts per customer, which means it has the best battery support for its customers. Um, so clearly KIUC, and I, I submit this to all of us because clearly KIUC to me is a wonderful model, 55%, 70% as soon as possible. But on their way to that goal, they too are experiencing the challenges of not, it's not just generating clean energy, which is important. The energy has to be reliable and it has to be affordable. And it is that challenge that all of us that are trying to move to renewable energy and maximize the use of renewable energy while keeping the lights on reliably and affordably, that is the challenge that we all face. And I thought the Kauai experience is useful for us to learn because we will be at 25% in a few years. The CCU and GPA are already talking about going to 50%. Um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe Senator Shelton, and I think you're a co-sponsor, Senator Rajel, is looking at Senator Pangolinan's original law that we helped write with him 11 years ago that wanted us to go to 25%, and I think to set a higher goal for us. And I, I personally would, would support that. I, I, I want us to go to as much renewables as possible, but we have, to me, we have to do it responsibly, reliably, and affordably. So with that as an introduction, I wanted to explain to the public why I voted to approve the contract to build a new combined cycle dual fuel generator on Guam. And these are just my own views as to why it's, it's no other commission members. I believe the following. The new generator will lower our power bills while still providing reliable power generation. It will lower our power bills by burning less oil and it will provide 24 seven power more reliably than 100% renewable alternatives can provide at this time. You cannot separate the cost of power from the reliability of power. Cheap power that is not reliable and reliable power that is, that is expensive does not serve our ratepayers. They desire both reliable power at the lowest cost possible. This generator will produce both reliable power at lower cost to ratepayers than what we have now. This new generator will play an essential role in lowering our power bills by also allowing us to reliably move from 25% of our energy coming from renewable sources in 2022 to 50% by 2030 as we are currently planning. Unlike our current generators, the proposed new generator can handle the regular intermittency that occurs with solar energy when cloud cover, extended periods of rain, and nighttime reduces the effectiveness and availability of solar energy. GPA and the CCU has consistently supported adding more renewables to lower our power bills, but without sacrificing reliability of service. GPA has already contracted for 160 megawatt, 165 megawatts of solar energy from private partners. GPA will turn on its first 40 megawatt battery in a few months. GPA is about to contract for another estimated 45 megawatts of renewable energy in partnership with the Navy and private partners. GPA is already the largest producer of renewable en energy on Guam and will remain committed to replacing carbon-based energy with renewables as fast and as affordably as possible, or at least this member will remain committed to that. And I believe my colleagues are also equally committed. In addition to adding this new generator, GPA is also pursuing a grid study to identify how to best add more renewable energy sources throughout the island affordability, affordably and without threatening reliability. Without the upgrades to the grid and this generator, our goal of moving to and beyond 50% renewable energy sources cannot be met. The new generator will also bring our generation mix into compliance with US EPA clean air standards and avoid costly and unnecessary fines. US EPA is requiring a solution sooner and not later. The new generator also implements the law to procure public-private partnerships to improve power generation. That law was passed 23 years ago to allow GPA to access private sector experience, expertise, and financing and has been successfully implemented by GPA numerous times to add new generation and renewables. The result was the end of load shedding and the contracting for 145 megawatts of solar energy. We have used this experience to create an agreement that transfers all the risks of this new plant to the private partner in order to protect ratepayers. There are significant protections for ratepayers should the private partner default on their obligations to build and operate a plant 
during their 25 years of ownership. The private partner KEPCO has significant global experience and financial resources to accomplish the job. In fact, KEPCO is also our partner for a 60 megawatt solar farm that will produce energy at half the cost of the LEAC today. This, this farm will help us meet that 25% energy requirement that we project in just a few years. Uh, I appreciate the concern over the inclusion by KEPCO of their subsidiary, KEWP, I'll call them Q for now. I appreciate that concern, it's a, it's a valid concern, over their inclusion as part of the KEPCO subsidiary. As I understand it, the concern is that CUPE has been sued in Guam by an insurance company for its management of Cabris 4 when it failed in 2015. I don't consider the fact that a lawsuit has been filed I don't consider the fact that a lawsuit has been filed as proof that a party is liable. But that is for the litigation to resolve. If we, but however, if we were to prohibit otherwise qualified companies to contract with our government just because they have been sued, then we, we would have to disqualify numerous businesses from government procurement. This morning I googled Aetna, the Aetna litigation. Aetna is the apparent winning health insurance provider for GovGuam and I attached it as on page as attachment two, just the Google search. There were 905,000 results related to Aetna litigation. Now, some of them referred to just lawsuits, some of them referred to settlements and judgments by Aetna. Should Aetna be disqualified from providing health insurance to the government of Guam because there has been litigation in other communities about health insurance? Will senators ask the governor to reconsider her decision to contract with Aetna just because there's been litigation? And I will point out that in Kauai, the batteries from AES and Tesla, reputable manufacturers, AES and Tesla have also been sued uh, for the products that they serve. If we're going to eliminate companies that have been simply because they've been sued, we run the risk of increasing the cost to our taxpayers and our ratepayers because these companies that may have the, most, uh, the best solution at the lowest price may be disqualified simply because uh, they were sued. And that would be a difficult trade-off that I would suggest to make uh, if you were to simply eliminate a company just because they were sued. I'm also concerned that any attempt to dictate to an otherwise qualified private partner would allow the partner to shift the risk back to GPA and its ratepayers. If GPA were to dictate who a partner subcontracts with, then the partner would require GPA to take on the risk of that decision. In fact, one of the issues with the Cabris 4 incident is that GPA built the plant and that CUPE came in as a manager of GPA employees much later. CUPE will argue that since they did not build the plant, they are not liable. The risk of fault includes many players. Instead, relying on the private partner to provide 100% of the construction and operation of the proposed plant, as we are contemplating now and as I voted for last week, it eliminates that problem of who is at fault. Very valid questions about who's at fault. Having your partner take on 100% of the risk eliminates that question. So I respectfully disagree that the filing of a lawsuit against an otherwise capable provider should be the only reason to disqualify them. Finally, there has been extensive public engagement in this matter since 2013 when the CCU and GPA proposed the development of this generation solution. The PUC authorized the procurement of such a potential solution nearly three years ago. As shown in the testimony of GPA, numerous public meetings and hearings were conducted in the development of this proposal. And last year, the Guam legislature conducted its own due diligence and passed the legislation allowing the siting of this proposed plant up north at Ukudu, I appreciate that these are complicated issues and that even with all the public discussion, there will be questions. But GPA, the CCU, the PUC, and the Guam legislature have been very transparent with their deliberations over the last six years. The PUC now takes over this process and citizens can bring their concerns and objections to the PUC for their consideration. I have always characterized the movement to more renewables as a migration and a journey, not a quick trip that will face unintended consequences. The Kauai story is a good cautionary tale for me and hopefully for you. 
I believe this new generator will serve our ratepayers best. When I think of my kids and grandchildren, I believe that this is the best decision for them. So Juice Masi, I'm ready to answer questions if you have any. I did have some comments on some of the earlier questions from some of the senators, if you would allow that. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Limtiaco. Oh, thank you, uh, Chairman Rogel, Senator uh, Perez. Uh, my name is Michael Limtiaco. I'm a commissioner on the CCU. Um, and um, I'm here to provide to answer any questions that you may have of me uh, as it pertains to the uh, uh, ECA um, and also just to go through some of the uh, uh, initial thoughts of you know during my evaluation of this ECA uh, as well as the um, recommendation by GPA you know in my decision-making process uh, as as to the award of KEPCO with the ECA you know GPA followed their procurement law uh, which resulted in the lowest price to rate payers. So with the use of the ultra low sulfur diesel, that translates into an 8% in a total reduction of the bill to the rate payers. Um, if they were to, uh, authorized by the PUC to pursue LNG, um, that has the potential of reducing the total bill to the rate payers by 21%. So as a commissioner, that's my focus is on the rate payers and how will it result in lower rates. Uh, this power plant will result in lower rates, initial lower rates. Um, now, when you combine that with the fact that this power plant will allow the utility to pursue even more renewables, you will see further reductions in the rate as we are able to not only address the grid and make improvements on the grid to handle the, uh, um, the intermittency that solars uh, provide, uh, solar systems provide, um, it will further reduce the rates to the rate pair. Um, the bid specification did not prohibit any company that is involved in litigation. And so to, you know, deny the award of the bid based on litigation, it would have to have been part of the spec. Now the government in all procurement has the ability to cancel the, the uh, solicitation in its entirety uh, if it's in the best interests of the, uh, uh, the people of Guam but we don't see that. I don't see that as a commissioner. I see that as, I see this award as reducing the rates by 8% using ultra low sulfur diesel and further reducing rates by 21% if they are allowed to go to LNG and further reducing it by adding additional renewables. But I think the main concern is whether or not these guys can do the job. Are they gonna do it? You know, they're being accused of blowing up a power plant uh, down at Cabras. Um, I think that's the main concern is are these people going to be able to do their job and th this company does business throughout the world uh, I'm sure that they've had they potentially have had other issues uh, along the way uh, no company is going to operate at a hundred percent perfect track record but I think the uh, the key is um, you know are they going to perform so they have a track record they have a proven track record um, they acknowledge the requirement of the contract that they have to provide 96% reliability. They do so by making sure that in their technical proposal that they provide the backup generation power to, to recover from any significant loss of a system, right? So the current power plant has three 45 megawatt turbines, right? That they have the ability to shut one off and do maintenance. If one goes down, they have the ability to generate other power by providing 64 megawatts of backup generation. This is on top of their 198 commit, uh, megawatt commitment to the utility. Um, they have a 25 megawatt battery to help them work with intermittency. So if one of their 45 meg units go down, that battery is gonna kick in and allow and, and fill the gap of power so that they can ramp up their backup generators in order to meet the capacity requirements that are uh, that are in the contract. Uh, furthermore, there's liquidated damages throughout the ECA. There's performance bond requirements. You know, and the question of whether this power plant is going to be able to work at its peak efficiency when it's transferred over to GPA. There's even a transfer uh, uh, mechanism where they have to they have to put up 15 million dollars. Uh, in um, uh, in uh, financing, or excuse me, in, in security to ensure that the, the overhaul occurs to the entire plant before it's transferred over to the utility. So I'm confident as a commissioner that there's significant protections in the ECA um, that will protect the ratepayer from it. 
Um, and I, I know it's been said um, by several of the speakers um, earlier today, but they bear all the risks, right? They bear all the risk. In fact, the solicitation required them to put up 20% of their own money. So they're on, if, if the plan ends up being $600 million, they're on the hook for $120 million of their own money that they, they stand to lose if they cannot perform. If they do not perform, the utility does not pay them. The rate payers do not pay them. Okay, so they, they have a lot of skin in the game, and that's one of the protections uh, that are provided by the ECA. Now, going back to the renewables, you know, the, there's been a lot of talk about why a fossil fuel plant? Why not 100% renewables? And, and the, the fact of the matter is, is that if you compare what it would cost to do what this plant will do, and I know that uh, uh, the general manager has, uh, has uh, spoke about this earlier, but I'll say it again, um, if you tried to do this with renewables, it would take 3,400 acres of land. Just consider that. Just consider where are we gonna find the land? Where would we find the land to do that? In addition, right, that land, the, the production of that solar farm can produce when the sun is shining, but we need the power in the evening. So you have to add uh, batteries to that. So GPA ran an analysis to compare what it would cost um, to provide this power with 100% renewables. The price came in at $3.7 billion. So if you want to go 100% renewables, much like what the CCU did with uh, Senator Pangolinan, is we can look at le legislation that requires the utility to go to 100% but we need to be, pre be prepared to pay for it. So if we were to institute this right now, we would see a massive increase in rates to the rate payer. Are we willing to pay for it? My job as a commissioner is to look what's in the best interest of the rate payer. This combined cycle plan reduces rates. It doesn't increase rates. So if we really are gung-ho about 100% renewables, we can look at it, but we need to be prepared to pay for it. I would have to hazard to guess that ratepayers do not want to see an increase in rates uh, to go to 100% renewables. However, having said that, the, the new power plant allows us to increase that portfolio. So many speakers have talked about the public law, which was um, public law 2962 that mandated 25% renewables by 2035. This, the utility, GPA, and the CCU will meet that goal in two years, I believe, 14 years ahead of schedule. And the plan is to increase those renewables significantly more, but you can't do it and provide reliability at the same time unless you're willing to pay more for power. So that's going to come at a very significant cost to the ratepayers if we do pursue that, but this power plan allows us to do it in a more cost-efficient manner. Um, you know, and then there's the talk about Kauai, right? Kauai being 55% renewables and having a goal to go to 100% renewables by 2045. So just put that time frame into context. This power plant will be completely paid off and become an asset of GPA by 2045. So in the same time of that, uh, between now and 2045, your CCU and the utility will continue to work to add more renewables and continue to try and put as many renewables to further lower the, the cost to the rate payer uh, and not wait until 2045. But that entire time, you will still have a generation plant that will able, be able to keep the lights on and to provide for you know, the hospital you know, um, emergency support, y you, need those you need that reliability. So there really is a trade-off, you know, what are the rate payers willing to pay for? If we want to keep, if we, if we want to focus on renewables, we can do that, but it'll come at a price. The last thing I want to uh, point out is uh, as, as a commissioner, I carefully scrutinize all of these claims as to are the, will, the rates, will the rates really go down? Show me, show me the money. Show me where these, the, the uh, cost is going to go down. And so if you refer to the presentation that I believe that the utility provided, 
the cost reduction strategy and the waterfall, it outlines what's going to be done, right? How are you going to achieve this, right? This new, plant, new, new power plant is going to cost us money. That's why you're seeing this reference to base rate increase, right? But it's going to reduce the consumption of fuel by 35 million gallons a year. So that's where the savings is, right, is at, right? So all of us concerned with, you know, the emissions and, and the environment, we are burning 35 million gallons less a year. That has a huge impact on the environment. Um, but it's, it comes from decommissioning these less efficient plants, these uh, high emission uh, contributing plants, uh, and as, as well as the reduction in labor. But more importantly, the, the utility doesn't have to go out and borrow this money themselves. They're relying on the independent power producer to take the full risk, to take the full financing, and if they don't perform, they don't get paid. And so that's the gist of my review of the ECA and the award. And I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Mr. Limtiako. <clears throat> um, so with regards to the rates, uh, you mentioned that it's because it's going to be burning less fuel, it's going to lower the rates. Don't renewables burn zero fuel? Shouldn't that lower their rates? It, it, it can, uh, Senator, but it would, be, it would cost significantly more money to put it on in order to provide the same amount of power generation that this uh, power plant will provide. So you're, you would be looking at a significantly higher base rate. You would have to increase rates. And so you guys have done studies on what the base rate increase would be if you had to well, I just, I, In my earlier testimony, I provided a, a quick analysis that GPA did regarding renewables. So you got to compare a $600 million plant to $3.7 billion for renewables. That's, that's the analysis. $3.7 billion to generate how much? The same. To, the same amount that the power plant To generate 198 megawatts. Correct. Correct. But also to store it, because you need it dispatchable, right? That's, that's the biggest problem is how can you efficiently dispatch it when you need it? You can produce all of the, the, the energy you need when the sun is shining, but if nobody's consuming it, you need a way to store it and then dispatch it when they do use it. So our peak demand comes after 6 p.m. Mm -hmm. when the sun is down. So you, the utility needs to be a, a way to store that power and then to dispatch it when the consumers demand it. Sure, yes, of course, storage. Yeah. <clears throat> um, which I find funny that the new power plant is also going to require storage, but that's another. But that's, no, to, but that's to allow them to meet their contractual obligation to us, the ratepayers, to meet load. It's not really, uh, they're protecting themselves, uh, as, as we tried to explain. In case one of their systems falls down, they can turn on a battery. That gives them enough time to turn on their generators. They're ensuring their risk to us that if they don't provide, hit the 96%, they get severely penalized. So they're protecting themselves in order to protect us. And, and that's why they made that technological choice to include um, a battery and a, and, and a renewable. And, and Senator, you know, you, you face the same dilemma we all do. It's sort of ironic to think, you mean I got to buy more oil to eventually buy less oil? But until the technology of renewables matures uh, to the point that it can carry the load reliably and affordably, we believe that this is the, the best, lowest cost, reliable, affordable alternative. But it will support, as, and even as Mr. Here's my vision of it, and Mr. Bissell alluded to it. He, sa he sees the generation, the, whatever generators remain as the backup to renewables. My vision for, I hope this is the last plant we buy. And in 25 years, let's say you pass the law and, and you give us till 2045 to get there. By then, the gener this generator is all paid for. You can just turn it off if you want. If we're 100% renewable by 2045 and it's with storage and it's reliable and it's at lower cost, then we will have achieved all, the, all of our goals and you could turn this plant on. But between now and then, the question is what, is, what are our choices? I think we would all agree you can't keep Cabris 1 and 2 on. That, that just goes in the wrong direction, higher costs and dirtier, right? And if you don't replace the, the capacity of 1, 2, 3, and 4 with something, then you can't have reliable power. So then what do you do? The bid said, went to the global industry, what do you think is the cheapest way to meet 200 megs? None of the industry bid 100% renewables, and the top three bidders all burn some sort of carbon-based 
fuel source because they recognize, I believe they recognize what we recognize is, is the journey to 100% renewable still requires us to burn some fuel, some oil, some carbon in, in getting there. Uh, it's, it's ironic, but it's, it's realistic. And, and when I see a, a small island, a, an island system further ahead, even them realizing, wow, I needed to keep that generator because I had load shedding when my renewables, for, for reasons that, you know, just beyond their control, it, it, you know, it makes me cautious about saying, perhaps in the same, in the same uh, enthusiasm against the, the, the plant that some have, I am, I'd be equally enthusiastic against the idea of 100% renewables, especially when you figure out the land and the cost. Now, the land piece will be partially addressed we want to, if we were to get to 50%, we could, we want to add another 200 so megs. I would like to point something out. You guys have been uh, putting forward this 3,000 acres for land. 3,500. But are, you're not taking into a f uh, account rooftops. So yeah, I was just yeah. going to speak to that. So I, I think the, some of the, th so we are doing utility scale because that's what GPA can do. But as you know, there's 2,000 customers already making their own energy, but they still use GPA. Most, 99% uh, How many megawatts do those 2,000 make? I'm sorry? How many megawatts did those 2,000 customers About 20, make? 20, 25 megs? Now? 25 megawatts. And how many GPA customers are there? 2,000 accounts is what I believe from the last report. I Some, mean, how many total how many GPA many customers are there? Think, I'm sorry, sir? 50, total GPA customers. There, we have 53,000. So 50,000. 50, 50,000, 51,000 customers. 2,000 of those rooftops are generating 20 megs. Right. So if you just do simple math and then you go 4,000, that's 40 megs. You go 6,000 and that's... Um, right, right. You could do so the math. You could, you could. Right. You could, but, if you covered every roof, yeah. you would. Okay, so, so the challenges are this. Power. You wouldn't need land. Well, that's not true. So uh, here's the challenge. The 2,000 that are currently making their own energy, they still rely on GPA for, the for being their battery, for being their backup at night, for being their backup when um, I read a Facebook post, a guy had put in his own system, but he had to buy some power when we, when we had 11 inches of rain. Just like Kauai had, had a challenge when they just, the weather didn't cooperate. So, that, I mean, that's the reliability issue that should also concern us. So, in the next 200 megs that I see us adding, I am hoping to branch out to more, access more land capacity with rooftop solar with using private companies that have land where they can make solar energy and put it into the grid. That's sort of the next phase that I envision. But it, 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 to us, strategically, to ignore that utility scale solar could already get us down to six and eight cents a kilowatt hour like we've already contracted for our LEAX at 15, it makes sense to us that let's do as much utility scale solar as we can. And then now that we're, we're pretty much there because land is an issue, the next issue will be trying to do rooftops, uh, vacant private land, and have uh, arrays of solar, or solar arrays created and putting the energy into the system. Yeah. So I think private land will, will play a large role in the next 200 megawatts. But while we're doing that, you still have to keep the lights on, which is why I, this generator to me is critical to do that. How much uh, will this new power plant be selling the power to GPA? What's the kilowatt? Uh uh, cent I, per if, kilowatt. If, I, if I'm reading this right, uh, and I'm, I'm sure someone in the I think uh, utility they mentioned five me. cents per kilowatt. Yeah, is that yeah, accurate? Correct. Does that include the LEAC too? Is that the total cost that they're selling? It no. We, if you recall, Senator, GPA provides the fuel to all the generators. So even though okay. we have a private partner, so they it, will sell it for five cents per kilowatt hour. But I read in one of uh, the uh, one of the documents that I got from your meeting, your CCU meeting that uh, the projected LEAC from the 2023 till, I guess, the life of the power plant mm -hmm. it averages about 12 cents per kilowatt hour. No, I think, the the I think the projections, correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's 15, it's 50, Right now 15. it's 15, 15, 15 and a half. No, I mean the power plant's cost for LEAC would be 12 cents per kilowatt hour. Is that correct? No, I, I don't believe so. so no, it's there's about a 10. Yeah. According to this, you're in Maybe so I saw a could. graph that said uh, if you guys used, or a chart that said if you guys used the new power plant, you'd be able to get the LEAC down to 12 cents. Correct. And 12 cents for the first few, like five years, 10 cents for one year, which I have no idea why one That's year was That's only for allowed cents. to go to gas. Only and for then, allowed to go to gas. But then after the 10 cents, it goes back up to 11 cents for the remaining years. So I averaged it out, and it was about, the average was 12 cents per kilowatt hour. For the cost of the plant or the cost of, of the fuel? 
Uh, specifically, and are you you referring to ULSD or are you referring to the uh, LNG potential? Okay, it's in one of the charts you guys had that said that the LEAC would be lower based on projected fuel costs because of the efficiency of the new power plant. And the prediction was from 2023 to 2030, it would be about 12 cents per kilowatt hour. In any event, the, the point I'm making is that there will be a LEAC uh, charge that's included that's added on to that five cents that's per correct. kilowatt correct, hour. Correct, that's correct. Which is, I mean, right now that's how it works now. Every generator has a fixed cost. The fixed cost may have debt, barrel. But so, then on top of that, the base rate pays that. Correct. On top of that is the so LEAC, which is fuel. So my question is, with solar, you just mentioned you had contracts for six cents per kilowatt hour. Is there any LEAC tied to the solar production? Yes, the energy that we would draw from these solar farms that at, we would be paying six to eight cents a kilowatt hour would replace the, the we but would dial zero, back the generators. But then zero fuel costs. Correct. So we would dial back the generators, especially on a good sunny day, we could dial back the generators that are burning fuel. They can so dial I, back and burn less fuel and let yeah. solar energy replace it. What I'm getting at is that the energy that the solar company is going to sell to you for six cents per kilowatt hour will not have any fuel costs uh, tied to that because they're just selling you sunlight energy correct, at six correct, cents per kilowatt correct, hour. Correct. It's the cheaper. power plant will sell you five cents per kilowatt hour, but in addition to that, that's not counting the fuel costs. Is that correct? That's what I'm trying to determine. That, that is correct, correct. Senator, that's but correct. you also that's have correct. to remember that so it's there's, actually, no, there's the no power storage. The cost will actually storage. be higher than five cents per kilowatt hour if you, f if you factor in fuel. You, you cannot well, the, dispatch the power when it's needed. The, the, the cost of any generator, all right, plus fuel, when you look at it, I, I think what John B. presented earlier, when, and you, if, when you get a chance to look at the testimony, this generator will be the lowest cost generator at five cents of any generator we have. So all the generators we currently have not only are more expensive to run, they burn more fuel. So, this plant okay. will be less expensive to run, burn and burn less fuel. And then when the sure. solar farms kick in, like on a good day, we dial that. He talks about the duck curve. You can dial back that new generator because you're getting 120 megs, 180 megs, three, 250 megs of solar. You dial back that generator. It's not burning fossil fuels because the solar yes, sure, is I'm putting it. And that's how you lower the LEAC because the LEAC is the fuel. So solar plays a key role in reducing our fuel costs. The challenge of solar is not the cost, it's the reliability. It, right now, solar is not reliable for us without significant fixed costs. Well, like the reason I'm, I'm bringing up the costs is because you guys are saying that this is better for ratepayers, but that's why I'm trying to determine what is cheaper for ratepayers. So if it's going to cost five cents per kilowatt hour on top of what's the fuel cost, what's the actual cost going to be for per kilowatt hour if you factor in fuel together with the five cents per kilowatt hour that they're going to be selling it to GPA for? Well, let's, let's compare uh, the MEC, which is our, our most efficient power plant today. Is that in their packet? Can we yeah. direct them to it? Or this uh, is in your packet, Senator? The cost for fuel from that most efficient power plant would be about $0.14 cents a kilowatt hour at $90 a barrel ultra low sulfur diesel. The cost for the new power plant will be about $0.10 cents at ultra low sulfur diesel. But the five cents that's there, though, you, you're correct. You add the five cents, and that's the total cost. The five cents, though, ensures you 24-7 uh, power. The, it's, not, it's not six and a half cents, it's eight and a half cents no? for the renewable, right? But that eight and a half does not include batteries that will give you 24-7 power. So it's not a direct. So by the time you put in all those batteries, and again, it's not just one battery, a set of batteries that give you one day supply. You need so a, we also need reserve to give you in case the, the sun does shine. What is the cost per kilowatt hour total for the new power plant if you count the five cent per kilowatt hour plus it's, the fuel it's cost? It's 15.5 cents total. So no? 15.5 cents yeah, total. That's, that's the for five cents plus the, uh, the 10 cents. 10 cents and the for five the fuel. cents comes out of your base rate and the 10 cents come out of your fuel. So just like the eight and a half cents uh, that is going to come from the LEAC, that's going to offset fuel costs. So for the solar contract you guys signed, what would be the total cost then? If it's, they're selling it at six cents or eight, one contract eight, six, eight, one is eight, 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 is that eight correct? Eight and a half cents. Total. Total cost. What, That's correct. But again, you, uh, now you're comparing fact, you said Apple, batteries, so we're comparing batteries. apples and oranges. No? The, the five cents here gives you 24-7 power. 
the zero cost on the on the LIAC or the renewable does not give you. Sure, I, I understand that. Yeah. I'm just trying to determine what the costs are because it's been represented that this is better for ratepayers. So I'm trying to determine what actually is cheaper rate wise. Yeah. And you are saying that it'll cost about 15 cents total if you count the five cents plus the fuel charges, 15 cents per kilowatt hour for the new power plant. But the solar contracts you entered into is six yeah. to eight cents per kilowatt hour. Yeah, total. But, but the comparison is apple to apple in terms of reliability, what it's going to give you power. So when you compare it against MEC 8 and 9, MEC 8 and 9 is about 19 cents. When you compare it to the other generators that we're currently running today, just on fuel, those power plants are, get, are costing around 19 to 20 cents a kilowatt hour uh, per day, just on fuel. So this is where the new power plant is going to offset and, and, and take all the production away from those uh, inefficient standby generators, which is what they're, you know, be. Uh, and that is the savings that's going to help pay for this plan without increasing the total cost to the consumer today. That's the, dif that's the difference between the two. And I would just like to add, Senator, that <clears throat> I like where you're going. The utility scale solar comes in at eight cents. The rooftop solar comes in at 25 cents. So this plant is much cheaper than rooftop solar and competes well against the utility scale solar because of the fact that it is reliable, more reliable than the utility scale. But if you want to go down the, the, the solar rates, uh, the eight and a half cents is, is very good, doesn't include the batteries to shift yet. The 19 cents is a la zone. That's the other contract that we have. We don't know what's coming down. We're hoping we can get better pricing, okay? But the rooftop solar, if you're going to take the view of, let's just put it on everybody's roof, rooftop solar is 25 cents. But that's under net metering. Yeah, but, yeah. but it, are you proposing that? See, everybody who does net metering wants net metering. They, they I'm don't saying want to there's other, there's other, um, Ways no, of doing saying, rooftop solar I'm aside from the metering. You can do solar host um, program. You can put your solar panels on every GovGuam building, and then you wouldn't have to pay for the building at but, all. You just put your panels on top of the building. Get that paid. would probably be a but cheaper they get than paid. the 25 cents. They would get paid based on the net metering concept, which is a one to one credit, which Senator, is a 25 no. cents. Just to make sure we're comparing, when you want to compare all the solar, I just want to bring that to yeah. everybody's attention that the utility scale farm is cheaper because of the volume, because of the size, and because the people come in and they have a way of doing that. The renewable rooftop solar is 25 cents. You need to just look at that, just so that we all get, if you put it on every building on the island, they still want their one-to-one -one credit. And they're still going to need a battery. So that, that's the challenge, Senator, is that even though you can generate energy without fuel at a very low cost to get the reliability and the the dispatchability, which means I want the power when I want it and all the power that I want when I want it. The, the challenge for renewable energy, particularly solar, is the fact that it needs batteries to provide that reliability. So you have to add the cost of the battery to the cost of the solar farm or an individual's solar array. And, and think of it this way, uh, I would hazard a guess and we can get you the right information, although we may not know this, but of the 2,000, 2,500 uh, NEM customers, uh, net metering customers, the great majority of them use GPA for the battery. So they've invested in their solar system, they're saving on fuel, but they didn't have to buy a battery because GPA acts as their battery and actually pays them full retail for the energy that they provide. So when you look at solar, you, you can't just look at the generation costs. Uh, you have to look at the, the storage costs because why is every solar array, as we look forward, including batteries? Because they realize solar alone, just from a generation point of view, isn't sufficient. You need the battery to give you the, dispatch, the reliability, the dispatchability that it's available when I, when I want it. So when you add gener um, solar panels with a solar battery, um, you know, it's, it's very challenging cost right, right now. Um, and so, but you're right, there are programs throughout the U.S. People are migrating in that direction of solar farms, uh, small, smart grids, smaller grids, uh, microgrids. I see all of that as potentially happening. 
but the, the challenge for us is to do it when the cost of renewables have trend, continue to trend down because they're more efficient, right? Uh, uh, we have an example here on Guam. The first solar farm bid out a few years ago was 20. Now we're down to eight. We want to ride that technology curve up as it improves in efficiency, and we want to ride the cost curve down. Um, I would, you know, I, I would have, I'm sure glad we didn't buy, you know, 500 megawatts of solar five years ago when we would have paid 20. By waiting just a few years, it's down to eight. Uh, I, I believe all of our utility uh, solar in the future will always include batteries. I believe the private sector is already including batteries in new, new arrays because everyone realizes to get affordability and reliability, you need to be able to generate it and store it in a battery safe, reliably, so you can have that cheaper power when you need it. They really are brothers and sisters. Affo uh, reliability, affordability, it must go with generation. You, you can't, we, we can generate all the energy you want, but it, it may not be reliable if you just relied 100% on solar energy today. And on, our ratepayers are asking for all of those boxes to be checked. You know, affordability, reliability, and, and availability. Um, and that's why we, we believe collectively to, to check off all those boxes by 2045, 2050, whatever you set as the new standard, this plant gives us a chance to check off all those boxes. Without this plant, we won't be able to check off the, all those boxes and US EPA will put us in a position where we're either retrofitting plants we don't want to retrofit or we face fines or both and you know, we don't want to go there. We, we, this is a solution that will begin to check off the boxes as we migrate, as we take this journey to whatever 100% renewables will be. As Mr. Bissell said, he's not sure either, but he's, he's not any less committed. We're not sure either, but we're definitely committed to bringing on renewables. And, and if you allow us, we would love to work with you as you change the renewable portfolio standard for Guam, because in, as Senator Ben brought up to us, he, you know, he understood that he didn't ask for 100% in 2009, you know, a year after he passed it. He realized it's, hey, you got to work on it. And he gave us 25 years and, and, and technology and our hard work and our, the expertise of, of very capable people at GPA got it done early. And, and we think we can do even more. We're, we don't even need, I mean, I hope you change the law, uh, but we're already shooting for 50% even without the law because we're committed. Because while we're also the generators of the power, we're also customers of the power. We're rate pairs like you, and we want to see that build go down as low as possible, just like you do. So I just have a, a question about the integrated resource plan. So you're, you're basically painting this picture where eventually we can um, resort to more renewable energy. So is, um, are the, is CCU, or are they going to work on that plan? We work on it regularly, Senator. We update it every two to three years. Uh, and, and we must because circumstances so, sorry, change. So the, can I just finish the questioning? So I guess the thought is, is that if this plan is being built at $3.1 billion, right, and if we're going to go move towards renewable energy. I'm sorry, the, plan, the current plan at $3.3 billion? It, Where did you is, get that number? So um, I think I read that somewhere. It's how much is the plant going to cost to build? We estimate five. The management has told us five. The estimate is between four and six hundred million. Three point something billion was the net present value, I believe, of the plant, if you looked at it, when they were trying to figure out pricing for us. But the cost to the ratepayer is five cents for every kilowatt hour produced. And That's that includes the, the, the okay. burning of the fuel. See? So, sorry, so if we're, if, if, the, if our, you know, if we're going to pay for this $600 million plant, and then you're talking about moving towards renewable energy, is this, mm -hmm. Um, you know, feasible? Is this, is this the right investment if we're going to move away from fuel burning plants? We, we think I mean, so. Is it, is it going to tie the community as far as financing? Uh, can we afford to, to actually well, move towards you know, renewable uh, energy if we're, well, if we're will, actually. It, it will tie us to financing, but it will also give us reliability, right? And, and that, remember, it's that we got to have so, both. So, how would that affect our capacity? to shift towards more renewable. Though. Well, we can add more renewables with this plant. That, I mean, that's our goal is to add more renewables. So, you know, what's the problem we're trying to solve? How so do we is, add more renewables? Is the financing going to be there? Because, you know, we're, we're going to ask the ratepayers to pay for it. Eventually, the ratepayers are going to be paying for this. For which? So, the for plant? both of these. So, I mean, the, this vision that you're yeah. painting and the fact that this plant 
is, uh, you know, there's an RFP out. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, ultimately it's the ratepayers that are going to pay for this. Yes. So, you know, if we're going to pay $600 million for a plant and then we're going to pay for renewable, it seems like we're just going to be adding more costs. Why can't we Did, plan okay. so that if we're going to move towards renewable, why can't we plan right. for, you know, this, the, you know, think about the rate pairs and, and all of this. Did you, cal this is, did, did you the calculate resource. the fuel savings though, Senator? When I hear some of the criticism uh, out there and the questions being asked, good questions, it's not just the cost of the plant, it's the cost of the plant and the s savings of fuel that make it economic. You have to look at the fuel savings. You can't just look at the cost of the plant. It's like you buy a more efficient air con because it reduces your power bill. You spend a little more now, but over time you get your m more than your money back from the savings. So when we look at this puzzle, we look at what investment will reduce the total power bill. Two thirds of the power bill is fuel. So let's look at investments that will reduce fuel. One of them is this plant because it checks off the reliability and, afford and, and affordability box so that's and the like, rest is renewables. That's what I would like to see is that actual numbers analysis that's, that's in the that's package. Done. That's how we get to the 23 cents and the 22 cents and this this detailed breakdown from GPA. We looked at a cost comparison of staying where we're at, building 100% renewables or building something in the middle that and, and what came out the lowest cost for ratepayers in our integrated resource plan was building a, a generator that burns less fuel, burns a cleaner fuel, and works with us and allows us to add more renewables. Sen you want to, I mean, that's, that's what came out. Senator Perez, if I could try and help you with this. He, here's what you need to look at. <clears throat> I've always looked at the fact that as we build this power plant, this allows us to put more renewables in. What we have doesn't as we build this power plant and we build out more renewables, we shut down the old power plants. Let me give you an illustration. When I say five cents a kilowatt hour, this contract in a year is priced out at about 70 million. Our MEC plants, when they were on the contract, the 5.5 cents, were priced out at 33 million, okay? So we're getting a pretty good deal. But when we shut down Tengisun 1 and 2 back in 2015 or 2014 or 2015, we started to save $7 million a year just by shutting that plant down. So as you move, and what, what we're really doing, Senator, is we're repowering generation. We have a good product here. We're gonna put something in that continues our reliable distribution of power to our ratepayers. As we put more renewables in, we shut down more of those old power plants. That also goes to address your greenhouse concern because the more renewables we put in, the better we are in terms of greenhouse gases. You have to shut down those old power plants. If you, the alternative, we continue to run everything and put more renewables on, we are polluting more, we're costing more. The, the, the rates work that way and that's why I personally take a view that's contrary to my manager, but you, you have the opportunity to shut down power plants. When you are able to shut down the older, more polluting power plants, then you get to the point where you, it's the best power plant you have in terms of the environment, in terms of the efficiency, in terms of the reliability, working with the more renewables as you add them on. Yeah, I, I understand the, the purpose for this power plant because you're trying to comply with the Clean Air Act, but since we're, you know, there's a policy decision that has to be made as far as can we get to uh, reduce the greenhouse gases. That's my, my positioning. And, and that's what I'm trying um, to tell you, Senator. This does it. This does it because you shut down more and more of the old power plants as you put on more and more renewable. Right. And, and as long it as, is cost effective. Yeah, as long as we're, you know, you know, we're thinking about the rate pair behind all of this because, you know, if we are shifting to renewables, yes. um, at the same time, we're putting a lot of money on this one power plant. I mean, that's my concern. Yes, um, I so understand. The other question that I have, is this contract site specific? Uh, so it's, it's yeah. actually for that particular site. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and...
And Senator Perez, I just want to, you know, one of the things that gets kind of lost in a lot of the technical jargon is this, the site specific, what, what you're referencing is why this particular location? And, and if you look at the packet in the presentation, it shows that the Harmon substation is tied into underground power lines that represent 60% of the entire load for GPA. So when we're talking about the ability to provide power during inclement weather typhoons, when you have these underground power lines that go to 60% of your load base, it's a good thing, all right? If you needed to do that on any other site, you would have to put in transmission lines at $10 million a mile, and they would be above ground. So they would still be um, affected by inclement weather. So that's one of the things that kind of gets lost in why this, air, why this location 60% of the entire load, all underground transmission lines, and more to come on when the Route 3 underground power lines that will service the military bases uh, come online, they'll be able to tie it in, which will increase the amount of uh, a percentage of the load that be will be serviced by underground power lines. And that's very critical to keeping the lights on during the typhoons. And the load growth is in the north, and, and first rule of a plan is you want to try to get it as close to load as, as is practicable to reduce your transmission costs. Uh, and as well, we take advantage of the environmental protections that we've always wanted to use the gray water at a secondary treatment wastewater plant, and now we get a chance to use that instead of using ocean water, having to get an NPDES permit to dump power ocean water back into the ocean. We eliminate all those environmental uh, issues that we have with the current technology. Uh, and we take advantage of the fact that the military is paying for a brand new wastewater treatment plant that will help our power company uh, avoid environmental damage by contracting with a provider who's going to build a plant at a site approved by the legislature last year that will allow us to service load, tie in most efficiently to our biggest circuit, the Harman, the whole, the whole Harman substation is sort of the center of the 60% of our capacity. It, it just fits, you know, it's all those things we took into account when we said, we think the best place to put it there. When we had the fire at Mobile from, at Pong Sona, I remember sitting with Ken Flores and John and said, when we build a plant next time, we gotta be careful, we couldn't get to that plant, the, the, the guys at the plant for almost 24 hours, right? It, nobody's fault, it just happened. But it reminded us of the vulnerability of keeping all of our generation in, the, in a place where a fire or a tsunami could take it out. We had just seen Fukushima and what happened there, we, and we became worried. So that's an, all those reasons were taken into account to choose to cite it uh, where, where we did. And we, it was already uh, M1 zone, and we put out a bid. So I know there was a question so, uh, a member of the public asked about the land. We, we had to buy land that was zoned properly. We put out a bid. We awarded it to the lowest price provider, and the PUC approved, the CCU approved it, the PUC approved it, and the legislature, the legislature was required to give us the authority to buy land. As you know, government agencies can't just run around and buy land when they want. We have to get legislative permission, and the legislature granted that permission. So even the legislature was involved, your predecessors were involved, and asked very similar questions, why there? Um, and that we and that selection that location became our preferred sele uh, location uh, for the the many reasons that you're hearing uh, this morning. And, and Senator Perez, one last thing regarding the 60% uh, load that I didn't mention was, you know, the utility only brings in revenue when it's selling power. So being tied to this 60% uh, load and being able to continue to generate revenue for the utility uh, during inclement weather, it affects ratepayers, right? If the, if the utility goes seven days without generating any revenue, it affects rates. So it, it, it impacts the ratepayers and by citing it at that location and be able to, to continue to generate revenue and sell power is, is, uh, you know, is a key to helping control rates to the ratepayer. So the uh, two significant plans are going to be around really to facilitate because I say facilitate is because without the conventional plan, you won't be able to get to more and more renewables. That's just a technical issue that is there, no? So the two plans are the, the, new, the new 198 and the MEC 8 and 9. The KEPCO plan will be running as much as possible because it's the most efficient. 
So I, what it does now is that as you add more in renewables, you're backing off the load from the MEC 8 and 9. And that is about uh, 14 cents a kilowatt hour. So as long as you can get renewables at lower than 14 cents a kilowatt hour, then now you're saving the rate there. So that's why it's, it's, it's so necessary. Uh, the new plan is necessary. Uh, otherwise, we just cannot meet the uh, needs of the island. Secondly, in three years, we won't have enough capacity to meet the load. And what does, and, and what does that mean? Even if you try to put renewables, it takes about three years just to put the uh, renewables. It takes about a year and a half just to contract for renewables. So there you're looking about, a, uh, from the time you start, takes you about four to five years to get renewables on. So the lights have to stay on and all of that. But then the other thing about renewables is that typically their life of the PVs are set to be around 20 years. So after 20 years, you have to redo another set or, or you know, take whatever is degraded. You need conventional energy uh, moving forward even as you make those trends transitions uh, during that period. So again, uh, like I've said before, this is most likely the last conventional plan that we will build. And it really uh, adjusts to the paradigm shift of generating power. It used to be base load running 24 seven. Now it's no, it's a combination of, of fast track units that will come up and down uh, and uh, work with renewables. And that's what this plan is. It's a base load unit that can turn, shift up and down quickly. Units that you can turn on and turn off uh, every day as necessary. And again, you don't do it all, you could do one. And so as more renewables come on, more you start to shut down and offset. And then, then you start to compete on 10, 10 cents. So renewables has to come in below 10 cents for you to lower your costs. But again, it gives you all those benchmarks moving forward. So you really cannot talk much more about renewables unless we, we put a plan that will facilitate renewables, which is what this uh, unit is, this plan is. Thank you, Senator Sabina. Uh, we are coming up on time now for what we've had allotted for this uh, hearing. We've actually gone over the time we had set aside, so uh, we'll go ahead and close out. Uh, I, would thank, I would like to thank the panel for attending today and for answering our questions. The committee will continue to accept any written testimony on today's oversight hearing. Written statements should be submitted within five business days from today and may be delivered to my office at 238 Archbishop Flores Street, Suite 906 of the DNA Building in Hagatnya. Statements may also be submitted via email to sen.cridgell at teleguam.net or you may send it via fax at 671-475-4768. This oversight hearing is now adjourned and the time is 12.04 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, Senator.